Good morning. Welcome to the Clinical Laboratory Fee Schedule Annual Laboratory Meeting. My name is Dr. Rashida Arthur, and as a member of the Medicare Clinical Laboratory Fee Schedule Policy Team and the Division of Ambulatory Services, I will facilitate today's meeting. I would like to begin by expressing appreciation for those who are able to attend in person and acknowledge those who are listening via teleconference and watching online. I would also like to extend a welcome to members of the Medicare Advisory Panel on Clinical Diagnostic Laboratory Tests who are also listening on the line and may participate by posing questions to presenters throughout this meeting. The Clinical Laboratory Fee Schedule Animal Public Meeting provides an opportunity for the public to present comments and recommendations on the basis of payment, establishing payment amounts for new or substantially revised Healthcare Common Procedure Coding System, or HCPCS codes, being considered for Medicare payment under the Clinical Lab Fee Schedule for the next calendar year. This meeting also provides a forum for the public to provide comments on certain reconsideration requests submitted during the previous year regarding final determinations on new and substantially revised test codes. Please note that we will be discussing only the codes addressed in our clinical lab fee schedule calendar year 2020 test code updates file, which is also found on our clinical lab fee schedule annual laboratory meeting webpage. Comments and recommendations on whether codes identified as gap fill codes from last year's final determination is a separate and distinct process that will not be discussed at this meeting. I would like now to share some logistical information regarding the flow and format of today's meeting. Presenters, as you are aware and may notice, we have a very packed agenda with approximately 40 speakers from various specialty societies and laboratories. We thank you in advance for your prompt delivery of your presentation in the 10 minute time frame allotted. Given the number of presentations, we'll be very strict on not allowing presentations to exceed the 10 minute mark. If you have any handouts, written comments, or copies of your presentation that you have not already provided to the public, please raise your hand and a member of the CMS team will collect those copies. Finally, if after the meeting you are interested in obtaining electronic copies of any presentation, you can request them by sending an email to the designated annual laboratory meeting resource box with the subject line CY 2020 ALM presentation. At the conclusion of each presentation, we will have a very brief maximum of five minute open forum for questions to presenters from those in the audience or the CDLT panel members on the teleconference line. Again, please keep your comments very brief and restrict any questions or comments toward the presentations on the new codes for 2020. We will not discuss any policy decisions during this meeting. Consistent with the annual laboratory fee schedule process, after this public meeting, we will accept public comments for 14 days, ending on Monday, July 8, 2019. Then, with the assistance and guidance of the Clinical Diagnostic Laboratory Test Advisory Panel, we will determine the basis of payment for each new or reconsidered laboratory test please refer to the CLFS website for more information on the upcoming Clinical Diagnostic Laboratory Test Advisory Panel meeting, which is scheduled for July 22nd and the 23rd. After consideration of the information from the ALM, public comments and Clinical Diagnostic Laboratory Test Advisory Panel recommendations will be considered and will also generally post preliminary payment determinations on our website in September of each year. We accept additional public comments from the posting of the preliminary payment determinations through October of each year. Unlike a new crosswalk test, the payment amount for the new gap fill test is not established when we determine the basis for payment because it takes approximately nine months for the clinical lab fee schedule annual public meeting for Max to establish Max specific amounts and report their amounts to CMS. In November of each year, we generally finalize the basis of payment for new and substantially revised test codes and the amount of payment through the annual CMS instruction implementing the updated CLS for the next CY. The public has an additional 60 days from the date we issue our annual instruction 
or in essence, the final payment determination to request reconsideration of either the basis of payment or the amount of payment for the new or substantially revised test code. The public may comment on those re reconsideration requests at the next CLFS annual public meeting. Once a code or a lab test has undergone a reconsideration cycle and CMS made second final determination on the code or test, the payment methodology is final. For any new test code that will be gap filled, we ask our Medicare contractors to develop carrier specific gap fill amounts by April 1st of the following year. The amounts will then be finalized by September 30th of the year. Unlike a test crosswalk to a CLS test lab code, the payment amount for a gap fill test is not established when we determine the basis for payment because it takes approximately nine months for our contractors to establish carrier specific price. After prices for the gap fill codes are developed by Medicare contractors, we will then post on our website and accept comments for 60 days. Later in the year, when the gap fill payment amounts are posted on the website as final, we'll accept reconsideration requests on the gap fill amounts for 30 days. Once the reconsideration process is completed for a cycle, the determination is final and we will not, and is not subject to further reconsideration. I lastly would like to share a few housekeeping issues. Please note the following. If you're using electrical outlets in the wall, please sit next to the outlet and avoid running electrical cords across aisles and walkways to prevent others from tripping over the electrical cords. Copies of the agenda and Wi-Fi connection instructions are available at the entrance of this auditorium. The restroom and the water fountain are located outside of this room toward the lobby on the left. The cafeteria is located at the lower level from the lobby in the back of the building. You can access the auditorium by either the elevator or the stairs. For taxi services, the guard in the lobby um, where you signed in can provide assistance. As a reminder, CMS is a smoke-free campus. Please place your electronic devices on silent or vibrate. And for teleconference members, please place your phone on mute. For any comments or questions, please step up to the microphone provided on the floor so all may hear you. For each presentation, there is a five minute limit for comments or questions. If you have any additional questions during the course of this meeting, please do not hesitate to reach out to a member of the Division of Ambulatory Services team. And if you have follow-up questions or need assistance after this meeting, please submit all inquiries to the annual laboratory resource box. Before we begin with the presentation, I would like to introduce the management team of the Division of Ambulatory Services. Corinne Axelride, Acting Deputy Director. Dr. Karen Nakano, the Chairperson for the Clinical Diagnostic Laboratory Test Advisory Panel. And finally, Carol Blackford, Director of the Hospital and Ambulatory Policy Group. This concludes my introductory and housekeeping comments. We will now hear remarks from Carol Blackford. Following her remarks, we will begin with our first presenter. Good morning, and uh, thank you to uh, the public and panel members for attending this meeting on payment methods for new and reconsidered clinical diagnostic laboratory test codes for the 2020 Medicare Clinical Lab Fee Schedule, also known as the CLFS. As always, we sincerely appreciate the public and the panel's expertise and values its contributions to improve CMS policy by strengthening the connection between Medicare payments and high quality, efficient care for our beneficiaries. As you heard, we have a very full agenda today, so I will keep my remarks very short. As you know, Section 1834 AF3 of the Social Security Act does require CMS to hold a public meeting to receive comments and recommendations from the public regarding the basis for establishing payment amounts for new or substantially revised laboratory test codes. CMS has held these public meetings annually for the CLFS since 2005. They are always very productive and informative and we thank you for your continued participation. As you are also aware, Section 1834A of the Act, as authorized by PAMA, does require CMS to implement a new method for setting payment amounts for tests on the clinical lab fee schedule, which we did implement in January of 2018. Generally, the payment amount for a test on the CLFS is based on the rates that private payers pay for the test. And for tests for which we receive no private payer data, the payment amount is based on crosswalking or gap filling methodologies. 
I'd like to note that we are at the tail end of the data collection period for which applicable laboratories began on January of this year, and that data collection period will end on June 30th, 2019. After the data collection period ends, data will be reported to us between January 1st, 2020 and March 31st, 2020. We will use that data to develop prices for tests starting January 2021. Last March of 2018, we did release the ADLT application and we have approved five in total, four since our last annual, annual laboratory meeting, and another round of applications can be submitted through July 31st, 2019. So we do look forward to receiving those applications. To the public and the panel members here and listening, again, we sincerely appreciate your contributions of professional expertise and experiences to this public process. And a special note of thanks to uh, the entire Division of Ambulatory Services team for all of their work in preparing and organizing these public meetings. It's never easy. So thank you very much. And with that, I will turn it back over to Rashida and Glenn. Thank you. Okay, we'll we begin with our first speaker from Griffles Diagnostic Solutions. Um, just a reminder, uh, presenters, there's an order of the presentations on the back of the agenda. Could you please begin to file over here as your presentation time slot begins? Um, so if um, presenters one through 10 could begin seated over here to the left so we can um, move through these presentations expeditiously. Um, also, a, a second note, there will be an individual in the audience who will be letting you know when the time limit is, <laughs> is up um, with marks of five to one and then stop. Additionally, there's a timer at the, at the corner of the room that states the 10 minutes. Um, and so we'll begin with our first presenter. Good morning. Uh, for those of you who are looking for the uh, printed copies for this presentation, you could probably stop now because we haven't provided any. So I would recommend you use the uh, email uh, previously mentioned to get copies of this presentation. Um, good morning all, my name is Joel DeJesus. I'm representing uh, Griffles Diagnostics. Um, and uh, I wanted to share with you uh, some information on um, the uh, ID Core XT. Uh, on October 11th, 2018, the FDA approved a uh, qualitative PCR and hybridization genotyping test for the simultaneous uh, identification of multiple alleles encoding human erythrocyte antigens, or HEAs, in genomic DNA extracted from whole blood specimens collected from EDTA. That's the official FDA descriptor of what they had approved uh, on uh, October uh, 11th. Um, the test is officially called and branded Griffles ID Core XT uh, and has the, been assigned uh, through the AMA uh, a PLA code uh, 0084U. Um, and in a press release uh, by uh, the FDA, uh, they state uh, basically the U.S. Uh, Food and Drug Administration today approved ID Core XT, a molecular based assay used in blood transfusion medicine, to help determine blood compatibility. The assay can be used to determine blood donor and patient non-ABO red cell uh, types. ID Core XT is the second molecular uh, assay approved in, um, uh, in use in transfusion medicine. So today, I recommend to the advisory panel uh, for their consideration that this second approved test by the FDA be crosswalked to the first approved test uh, by the FDA. Specifically, we would like to crosswalk uh, 0084U to 0001U, uh, which uh, has an indicated um, NLA um, on the screen. Uh, these tests, as you could see, uh, have uh, similar, um, the tests have similar descriptors as assigned by the uh, AMA through its uh, PLA process. Um, if we look a little bit further, um, in addition, uh, the uh, FDA approved uh, indications for use are substantially equivalent for each one of these tests. Uh, the new code or the new test uh, 800-084U uh, on the left and the first uh, approved test on the right. I'll give you a second just to read through that and take pictures for those who 
don't have hard copies. Oops. So when you compare the uh, content of each one of these assays or panel of antigens in interrogated by both tests, um, the coverage uh, essentially is the same for um, higher frequency blood groups, uh, but there are slight differences on the uh, low frequency uh, blood groups, and those are out towards the bottom of the page. Um, so these are the uh, actual content of uh, each one of the tests. So in essence, uh, they practically do the same uh, type of um, uh, thing in, or in providing uh, answers to uh, the transfusion medicine group. So with, with these uh, lists of similarities, we, uh, in summary, we recommend for the consideration of the advisory panel crosswalking PLA code 008 for you to PLA code 001 U. Um, and that is my, my quick presentation, likely in record-breaking time. Questions? Are we taking questions? Are there any questions from the audience? Um, now we'd like to open the line for those on the line. Are there any questions from individuals on the line? We'll be moving on to our second presenter. Thank you. I'll be presenting on 0082U. It's drug tests, definitive, 90 or more drug tests or substances. It's uh, done in definitive chromatography with mass spectrometry and has a presumptive any number of drug classes by instrument chem chemistry analyzer utilizing immunoassay. It's in urine. It reports the presence or absence of each drug, drug metabolite or substance with description and severity of significant interactions per date of service. <clears throat> there are no crosswalk codes. We're requesting a gap fill between CMS tiers two and three in the payment of 17908. The logic is this test contains some drug classes which are NOS and will not crosswalk to a G code. Um, there is fraud, waste, and abuse concerns in the industry regarding high cost community trend profiles. So we're hoping that this price aligns with our payers and our providers. And as you know, uh, some commercial payers do see CMS pricing of tiers three and four and will indeed price them uh, as a GO 482. The rationale um, for this test regarding economic utility was shown in the Laffer Associates paper. Um, obviously, there's a cost benefit of urine drug testing. One thing that's important to note about this paper is these tests were a comprehensive drug test. So these were not a screen first, um, which is required by some payers as well, that relies on immunoassay as a way of determining uh, which tests will be definitive and sent to um, or, or determine whether or not they are positive. The second aspect of supportive rationale is we at Precision have noticed uh, quite a bit of missed or non-ordered positive analytes in testing. And a lot of these analytes um, are involved in different DDIs or drug-drug interactions. So in terms of patient care, um, there's a lot being missed here by doing a screen first or by a provider kind of taking guesswork in determining which test they want to order due to medical necessity. The second aspect is there was an LCD um, that described uh, community trend profiles. Um, as you know, standing orders in urine drug testing uh, cannot be panels. However, profiles are considered uh, if they are community trends. Now, determining a community trend can be difficult for a provider, however, Precision does offer um, providers po past positives from their community in order to determine whether or not this is a viable test for them. And that's all from us. And I beat the last time. <laughs> Are there any questions? One in the back. Thank you. Um, I'm Dr. Nakano, one of the DAS member teams. 
uh, DAS member, team member, excuse me. Quick question for you. You said that your test is a um, panel and that it is for de definitive screening with the thinking that um, drug screening qualitative tests will not be required. Did I understand that correctly? So um, to answer your question, uh, our test is described as a profile rather than a panel um, based on a community trend. Uh, with our test, you've noticed that we do a presumptive and definitive test in one, um, which of course will exclude the opportunity or, or payment of any prior uh, uh, presumptive testing. So the 80305 through 7 would not be applicable um, because of this test. Any other questions? How about from the audience or online? Are there any questions no online? Question. No question at this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, presenter number three. Good morning. My, my name is Burkhard Jansen. I'm Dermtech's chief medical officer, and I'm here regarding Dermtech's melanoma rule out test. I'm here regarding. 0089U melanoma gene expression profiling by RTQPCR with the targets PRAIM and LINK using superficial collection, using uh, adhesive patches for superficial collection. We requested on May 8, 2019, that the code 0089U be retired and are therefore not making any recommendations for crosswalk or gap fill. The deletion of this code is expected to be published by CPT with the Q3 2019 PLA determination on October 1, 2019. So I guess my presentation actually beats the super short first one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Any questions from those on the line? Great. No question at this moment. Thank you. We'll move on to our fourth presenter, Michael Jen DX. Good morning. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present the pricing. I am uh, Damon Cox, Chief Business Officer of Microgen DX. I'm joined by Jennifer White, our Lab Operations Director. And we are presenting on our code 0112U, Infectious Agent Detection and Identification, Targeted Sequence Analysis for 16S and 18S RNA genes with drug resistance gene. We may have one of the shorter presentations as well. Um, we are recommending crosswalk to the CPT code of 81445 with the rationale that the uh, instrumentation utilized uh, is very similar, the cost of the reagents and the supplies and the uh, complexity of the methodology uh, is in line with this code as well. And I'd like for uh, Jennifer to uh, uh, maybe make some additional comments on, uh, on some of that rationale. Sure. The code that we decided to crosswalk was the 81445. We compared it to the True Sight tumor kit that Illumina MySeq has. Um, we also use the Illumina MySeq. It um, is the same instrument that we uh, utilize in our test. We also go through several steps, just like the True Sight tumor kit, where we do library preparation, uh, fragment size selection, quality control, um, concentration, and dilution steps. Uh, the reagents that we use are comparable to the TrueSight tumor kit in that we are doing sequencing for two genes. They do 15. Um, we also look at 14 different drug-resistant genes, as well as the 16S for bacterial identification and the ITS for fungal identification. 
And then um, as far as complexity, we go through similar lab preparation parts, and then the bioinformatics is also very similar. It goes through a, um, excuse me, a fragment cleanup step and a quality control, a demultiplexing fast Q generation, and um, several different uh, singleton and um, uh, quality control steps. Thank you. So based on that rationale, we are recommending the crosswalk to the 81445 and happy to take any questions. Question in the back. Hi, this is Dr. Nakano again. Um, the information that Jennifer just shared with us, would you be so kind as to submit that in your public comment? That those details would be um, very helpful for us. Thank you. We will submit those, yes. Thank you very much. Moving on to presenter number five. Good morning and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. Uh, I'm Scott Nelson. I'm the head of managed care for Decipher Biosciences, formerly known as Genome DX Biosciences. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is our uh, genomic classifier, uh, Decipher Prostate. We're applying for a Category 1 um, MAAA code 815 xx and it's, um, the description is Oncology Prostate, microRNA, microarray gene expression profiling of 22 content genes utilizing FFPE embedded tissue algorithm reported as a metastasis risk score. So our rationale uh, is uh, we're seeking a crosswalk to 81519, which is Oncotype Breast trade name. And uh, our rationale is that we are a similar gene expre uh, pre expression profiling test using the same material uh, to tumor tissue with a multi-analyte algorithm used to pregenerate a score result. Um, we also have a similar number of content genes as they would and also similar function, utility, and clinical value in a respective oncologic disease state. Um, that's my presentation. Any questions? In the back. Karen Nakano again. Can you please tell me what is the um, AMA CPT CAT1 code number? Have you been assigned a code number? We have um, not been assigned a code number at this time. We have 815XX is what we have been reporting. Ah, okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions? Any questions from on the line? Okay. Thank no you. question at this moment. Perfect. Thank you. We'll move on to our next presenter. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. My name's Bruce Quinn. Um, I'm a consultant for Illumina. Um, by training, I'm a pathologist, and I work full-time on federal health policy. The code is 0111U. Uh, this is an FDA-approved next-generation sequencing uh, gene panel test. Uh, it therefore falls under the CMS recent NCD for oncology and next-generation sequencing. Um, the full descriptor uh, from AMA is uh, colon cancer targeted KRAS, codons 12, 13, 61, NRAS, codons 12, 13, 61, gene analysis, formal and tissue. As you'll see, the full test is, is longer than the AMA PLA description. This is the, was the first FDA-approved uh, combination diagnostic for NGS RAS genes. It was also the first that had the NRAS gene in addition to the KRAS gene. It's been clinically validated for identification of colorectal cancer patients who uh, should not be treated with a EGFR monoclonal antibody like Vectabix. And this was uh, meaning if this, if this test is positive, then those monoclonal antibodies are contraindicated. And this test was uh, validated for 56 mutations in the RAS genes. They cover exons 2, 3, and 4 in both KRAS and, again, in NRAS. 
It's a much larger panel than the original 2012 FDA approval for KRAS, which was only seven mutations, uh, and this one is 56. Um, in addition, uh, um, this is probably the key slide, and I draw your attention to the graphics. Uh, so in exon 2, we have codons 12 and 13. In exon 3, codons 59 and 61. In exon 4, codons 117 and 146. So for KRAS, we map very cleanly onto the base code 81275 plus the extended KRAS, uh, which is uh, from 2016, 81276. Then moving ahead to the NRAS gene, which is also sequenced, we have the same uh, codons, exon 2 and exon 3. And for NRAS, it's worded a little differently. Exon 2 and exon 3 are together in 831311, so we map to that. But then we also have uh, codons 117 and 146, so we have an additional code as well, or an extended NRAS, so to speak. And the crosswalk we've proposed is 81275 plus 276. That's shown in the top boxes. And 81311 for exon 2 and 3. 81276, which is a mapping uh, to the exon 4 of NRAS. So basically, the different codons and exons that we have in both genes map uh, squarely onto to those four codes. This shows the full range of activating mutations de detected. I mentioned the original FDA-approved tests uh, just had seven mutations. We have 56. Um, so to summarize, the rationale is that for both NRAS and KRAS, we exceed the base code that is in the CPT. The KRAS has an additional code that's already in position, so we can use that. The NRAS does not, so that's why we suggest copying the extended code twice. Um, in, we also suggest not discounting further. We know CMS is, uh, you know, asked to be careful about stacking codes, uh, but in this case, it's a very elaborate next generation sequencing large um, test, uh, and therefore we suggest do not discount further to allow for the resources and FDA valid validation. FDA validation. Thank you. And I will stay on this slide in case there are any questions. Okay. Any questions from the line? Thank you. No question at this moment. Oh my gosh. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to present on behalf of Rady Children's Institute for Genomic Medicine. My name is Russell Knopfsinger. Uh, I'm the Director of Business Development for the Genome Institute. Uh, for those of you who probably don't know, uh, we are the sister organization of Rady Children's Hospital uh, based in San Diego, California. We are a mission-driven nonprofit who has spent most of the last three years uh, developing a platform for clinical uh, diagnoses uh, for pediatric and neonatal patients who are acutely ill uh, with disease of unknown ideology. I will be making a recommendation uh, for our PLA code around that platform. It's code 0094U, uh, test name RCIGM, Rapid Whole Genome Sequencing. A long descriptor you'll note is very similar to the uh, descriptor for the CPT code for clinical whole genome sequencing with the primary differentiator being that this is a rapid test. And so with that in mind, I wanted to um, offer a suggestion or a recommendation for pricing that, the, that our PLA code be crosswalked to 81425 with a multiplier of 8 point, uh, excuse me, 1.8x. I will uh, explain how we got to that number momentarily. Uh, 81425 is priced at 5031 and so with the 1.8x multiplier, that will come to a price point of uh, $9,056. Uh, 
And so, as I've mentioned, uh, Rady Children's Institute for Genomic Medicine uh, is a nonprofit, mission driven uh, organization that's focused on bringing precision care to um, acutely ill pediatric and ne neonatal patients. And what we've developed is a platform whereby we use clinical whole genome sequencing to provide uh, molecular diagnoses to enable precision care for acutely ill uh, patients in the NICU and PICU. And I want to stress that what we've developed is a platform. This isn't just an ordinary test. It's not, it's not a typical genetic test where a physician orders a test and gets a report. We have end-to-end -end clinical engagement. And uh, in the publication noted here by Farnes et al. in 2018, as well as a series of other publications on research that we've done over the last couple of years, we've not only identified the patient segments uh, with the highest uh, clinical utility for this test, but we've really evolved a process and, and identified the key factors that drive uh, clinical utility for this platform. And uh, I want to point out two especially because they are driving the, the recommended price uh, increase above the CPT code for clinical whole genome sequencing. And so we focused on making sure that the platform is, uh, has the highest clinical utility possible. And two of the main components to that, are drive, that, that are driving that are turnaround time. And so we're dealing with babies in the NICU or PICU that are uh, acutely ill, oftentimes deteriorating rapidly. And so turning around a diagnosis in a matter of days versus a matter of weeks uh, is often life changing and, and life impactful for these patients. And so we've uh, evolved this platform to have a turnaround time uh, from receiving a sample to providing a diagnosis. Uh, in just four or five days on average with some tests uh, having results returned in as quickly as two days from a whole genome sequencing test. And so um, in addition to the quick turnaround time, another thing that's made this platform uh, have a high clinical utility in this patient segment is we have a, a high degree of clinical engagement. And again, that's why I point out that it's not just a, a genetic test, it's really a platform solution. And so. Our, our clinical team, um, from medical directors to lab directors to genetic counselors, are engaged with the physicians ordering this test uh, from the time they're trying to identify the right patients that will benefit from it, uh, as well as on the return of results and kind of how to manage those results with their patients. And so it's really a platform that has end-to-end uh, -end clinical engagement uh, throughout this several-day process. Um, Again, we're, re we're recommending a multiplier of 1.8 on the CPT code 81425, and the primary reason for that multiplier is to, is to, uh, to satisfy the increased costs that are required to support this clinical engagement that I've just alluded to, as well as the rapid ascertainment of the diagnosis. So the preliminary uh, published cost for the CPT code that, that for clinical whole genome sequencing was uh, was $5,031, and in part of that pricing process that went through uh, CMS last year, we had submitted our costs as one of the, the folks who submitted uh, public comment to kind of uh, land on a new price, and at that point we had submitted uh, a price of our cost to perform this, this uh, procedure of 8,482, and as a mission-driven nonprofit, we're, we're able to be pretty transparent about costs. There's nothing... Uh, proprietary or, or secret about it, and so we, uh, we're happy to share that again. Also, when uh, Palmetto reached back out to us uh, in the final stages of that process for pricing CPT 81425 last year, we'd actually uh, shared a more updated cost model that was $9,273. And so you can see um, the price point for us, there's kind of no margin, we're not cooking in any cost for for R&D, that sort of thing. We're really just looking to uh, establish a price point for this PLA code that enables us to uh, sustainably provide access to this platform to patients that need it. Uh, we have one research program that we're, excuse me, a QI program that we're conducting right now for the state of California for Medi-Cal patients. For that program, the test is priced at $8,500, again, cost recovery. and so. Uh, that's where we got to the, the 1.8x multiplier on the CPT code for uh, standard clinical whole genome sequencing. Uh, I won't belabor the, uh, the details of what this test does and doesn't cover. I can address those in questions if anyone has them. Uh, again, so Rady spent a couple years developing this, uh, this platform through research protocols. Uh, the numbers that I want to draw your attention to are on the far right two columns. So diagnostic rate for this sort of testing turns out to be largely a, a result of the patients that you're performing the test upon. So what we've really driven is to optimize the change in management metric on the far right column. 
And what that means is the molecular diagnoses that we've provided, along with reference in the report that we've shared that links that variant uh, that's been identified in that patient with a potential change in therapy. Uh, we're trying to drive that number up. And as you can see in these uh, first four uh, research studies that are, that, where there's data shared here, that, that percentage ranges from 44 to 79 percent of the patients that get a diagnosis uh, have a, a change in therapy as a result of that diagnosis. And last, uh, last slide to speak to, I just want to point out a couple steps in kind of what we're doing uh, with our rapid whole genome sequencing platform versus traditional whole genome sequencing and uh, mention them because they're driving the cost again. So if you notice the colored panel in the middle, uh, library preparation and the actual whole genome sequencing process itself in the yellow and green boxes, second and third from the top. Uh, we're not able to batch samples, so we're running this uh, test stat. So we get the samples in and we sequence them, prepare libraries, sequence them the same day. Uh, we sequence them on Illumina NovaSeq uh, 6000 instrument, often with just a couple samples per run, and so that drives the costs up. And also, uh, our, in the second to the bottom, our interpretation and reporting process is also expedited in a way that drives up uh, labor cost and drives up cost for some licensing fees and other things like that that we have to uh, incorporate in the cost of our test. Um, last slide I'm going to flip to just uh, as a reference, but I'm not going to speak to it. It actually has some of the numbers on our costs from the left in a publication, from the right in an email that we shared with uh, Palmetto last year. And uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions from those on the line? No question at this moment. Thank you. We'll move on to our next presenter. BioRed Laboratories. Good morning. Thank you. Um, my name is Alfredo Villarreal, and I'm representing BioRed Laboratories for the following two PLA codes, 64U and 65U. I'll begin with 65U. Um, this is a syphilis test, a non treponemal antibody immunoassay, qualitative RPR assay. I think it's the, the first of its kind. And uh, we're doing a similar crosswalk uh, to an existing code that, uh, excuse me, that exists. The recommendation is um, for your consideration is to um, go through the, um, this one. I'll start with 65U and then I'll start with, finish with 64U. So um, the RPR assay on the Bioplex 2200 is a um, the descriptor is syphilis test, non treponemal antibody, immunoassay quantitative, and we want to crosswalk it to uh, CPT code 86318 for your consideration, which is an immunoassay for infectious antigen, uh, excuse me, infectious antibody, qualitative or semi quantitative single step. The CPT LNA code uh, re um, reimbursement was 1809. And this is more in line, and the recommendation is because it's more in line with an immunoassay instead of an agglutination or flocculation tests. It uh, uses a capture site that is coated with a mixture of cardiolipin antigen, cholesterol, and lecithin. And an older CPT code does exist, but it does not take into consideration the immunoassay methodology. Um, and with that, I'll move on to uh, 64U, which is actually giving you a treponemal result as well as a reagent result, um, an antibody treponemal pallidum total and a rapid plasma reagent immunoassay together. So it's two reportable results, and we simply want to crosswalk it to 86780, which it already exists. It's an antibody treponemal pallidum plus the um, uh, 64, excuse me, 65U, which we um, are recommending to recommend crosswalk to 86.318 for a total of um, $32.80. That's it. Questions? Any 
Any questions for those on the line? Okay. I'm going to do one quick check. Uh, correction, Commonwealth Diagnostics will be presenting next. So I'm Mike Ryan. I am an attorney with McDermott, Will and & Emery, and I'm here as a consultant for Commonwealth Diagnostics. Uh, they're the developer and manufacturer of the proprietary IBS check assay, which is a semi-quantitative test for the detection of anti-CDTP anti and um, anti-vinculin antibodies um, in human plasma. And the result of that test is intended to be used in the diagnosis of IBS with diarrhea predominant or mixed symptoms. The code we're talking about today is 085U, um, cytolethal distending toxin B, and vinculin IgG antibodies by immunoassay, i.e. ELISA. This code is specific to uh, Commonwealth's IBS check test. And the recommendation we're making today is not to, not to do anything with it because Commonwealth has asked uh, CPT to delete this code as of, the, as of the next review cycle, so Q3. So under CPT policy, uh, the lab or manufacturer whose test is described by a PLA code can ask for it to be deleted at any time. That request has already been submitted, and the AMA is expected to publish um, the announcement of deletion on October 1, 2019, and the code will be effect deleted effective January 1, 2020. So as a result, there's no need to set a payment rate for the code at this time. Any questions? Any questions from those on the line? Thank you. We'll be moving on to our next presenter, uh, presenter 10, Novartis. Good morning. My name is David Parker. I'm with Precision for Medicine. We're a consultancy supporting Novartis Pharmaceuticals. Uh, who is the formal uh, sponsor of Tier 1 code 8XX01, pic 3 ca uh, The descriptor is up on screen here. Um, and our crosswalking rationale is linked to the justification for creating the new Tier 1 code. Uh, so I'd like to begin by recapping that justification. Um, so since uh, 2015, PIK3CA mutation analysis was described by the Tier 2 code 81404 uh, and was performed for a variety of prognostic and non-companion diagnostic treatment guidance purposes. A variety of laboratories had created LDTs for this test, um, and they used a variety of homebrew PCR assays, Sanger sequencing, and in one or two excuse me, one or two cases, uh, potentially targeted next-gen sequencing. The Tier 1 PIK3CA code was created primarily to reflect an increase in testing and a need to specifically identify those tests for use as a companion diagnostic to an FDA-approved uh, drug, uh, PICRE, alpelacib, uh, for um, advanced breast cancer in PIK3CA mutated patients. Uh, on May 24th, the drug alpelacib and the associated companion diagnostic test were both approved simultaneously by the FDA. As, <clears throat> excuse me, as specified in the PICRE indication, um, Alpelacib is indicated only for patients with PIK3CA mutations, and the FDA-approved companion diagnostic test, you can see the indication and intended use statement up there, uh, is a test kit product designed to detect 11 mutations in three PIK3CA uh, exons using real-time PCR. Notably, the approved companion diagnostic was approved to detect mutations in both formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissue, and in circulating tumor DNA derived from plasma. Uh, it is, at this time, the only FDA-approved companion diagnostic test for alpelacib. 
Notably, in line with the companion diagnostic indication, and in contrast with the PIK3CA gene descriptor eight, under 81404, the gene descriptor for the new Tier 1 code specifically identifies, let me go back so you can see it again, specifically identifies the indication for the drug, namely breast cancer, uh, and it increased the number of exons in the EG statement from two to three, and specifically describes the exons measured by the companion diagnostic test. Okay. So our recommendation is a crosswalk to uh, two times the valuation of 81404, uh, or approximately $550. We're aware of several recommendations for a crosswalk to 81314, which is uh, for PDGFRA, based on a general uh, assumption of similarity and resource requirements. Uh, we note, however, that the PDGFRA code does not describe any FDA-approved labeled companion diagnostic test, and that creates a significant difference in the resources required to perform this companion diagnostic test. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So noting differences between 81404 and the new Tier 1 code, first of all, as I mentioned, the LDTs described by the old code are a variety uh, of different tests that assess different mutations in a variety of different exons and use uh, methodologies which differ considerably in resource uh, intensity. Uh, and in fact, the, um, the PDG, uh, the, um, uh, sorry, the PIK3CA descriptor under 81404 specifically mentioned an assumption that only two exons might be examined. Uh, we further note that none of the LDTs described by 81404 were validated or offered by the testing laboratories for performance on uh, CT DNA derived from plasma and presumably were not validated for that application. Okay. We further note and, and remind uh, that the descriptor for the new Tier 1 code specifically reflects the nature of the CDX test as opposed to the nature of any of the LDTs uh, that um, were described by 81404. Um, and accordingly, because of the similarity uh, between the code descriptor, descriptor and the procedure description for the Tier 1 code, we believe it's appropriate to crosswalk the valuation of the new PIK3CA Tier 1 code, uh, not to an LDT, but instead to reflect the higher actual cost of performing the labeled CDX assay. To assess those actual costs, we obtained information regarding the cost of test kit development and manufacture from the CDX test manufacturer, and also on labor and overhead uh, costs of performing the test from Novartis's day one preferred laboratory partner, uh, Neogenomics. Uh, we first note that substantial upfront investment was required from the test manufacturer for clinical validation and regulatory activities to secure approved labeling as a CDX. And as you all know, that's not a trivial amount of investment required. Um, we note that that investment has not been required either for PDGFRA or for any of the LDTs described by 81404. Moreover, the CDX kit manufacturer performed validation and obtained an FDA approval not only for use in formal and fixed tissue, but also uh, for circulating tumor DNA. Um, the manufacturer calculates that the all-in fully loaded cost of the approved PIK3CA uh, CDX test is $373 per individual test result. Uh, this includes pre-manufacturing investments and costs for R&D, external clinical validation testing, regular work, regulatory work for, two P, or for a PMA filing for two different sample types, FDA fees, 
cell line manufacturing royalty payments and licensing fees to the PIC3CA IP holder. These are real expenses, real costs of bringing a labeled CDX to market uh, and cannot be overlooked in the valuation of the code. <coughs> Excuse me, the $373 cost also includes costs of goods sold comprising raw materials and labor for manufacturing, QC costs, and shipping. Neogenomics has further calculated that the labor and overhead costs of performing the test above and beyond the cost of the test kit itself is an additional $232 per single test. These costs include sample receipt and accessioning, block cutting and staining, sample preparation and the run of the test itself, as well as clinical history review, pathology sign out tax, excuse me, tax and freight, and logistics. And they point out, importantly, that this is a minimum labor and overhead cost based on a maximum capacity testing scenario with six samples per batch and does not include any laboratory profit. Okay. Together, the cost of performing a PIC3CA mutational analysis using the FDA-approved CDX test the specific test that justified the Tier 1 code and is reflected in the descriptor and the procedure description is at least $605 per test. So clearly, the resources required to bring this test to clinical use are considerably greater than those required for LDT tests previously described by 81404 or by an alternative crosswalk to a PDGF-RA test. Accordingly, we are recommending crosswalking to a two times multiplier of 81404. And even though the uh, total valuation of approximately $550 is somewhat less than the cost to actually perform the test, we believe it should be adequate to cover the cost of performing all uh, PIC3CA testing that might be described by the new Tier 1 code, including both CDX testing, which would be the majority of the tests performed, as well as some legacy non-companion diagnostic LDT testing previously described by 81404. Thank you. Questions? No? Okay. Any questions from those on the line? Thank you. We'll be moving on to our next presenter, Synostics. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to present to the group today. My name is Mike Harris. I'm Chief Executive Officer for Cernostics, we're a Pittsburgh-based life science and uh, company and clinical reference laboratory. Today I'll be presenting to you the tissue cipher Barrett's esophagus assay, a precision medicine test that predicts development of esophageal cancer in patients with Barrett's esophagus. What is the clinical need this test addresses? Barrett's esophagus is a highly prevalent disease affecting 5.6% of U.S. adults. It's estimated that 3 million Barrett's esophagus patients are in active surveillance, meaning they undergo an upper GI endoscopy every three months to five years, depending on the severity of the disease. Barrett's develops in response to acid and bile damage to the esophageal lining caused by chronic heartburn, otherwise known as GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease, and is a major risk factor for developing esophageal adenocarcinoma, thus the need for active surveillance. This version of esophageal cancer is highly lethal with median survival of less than 11 months and five-year survival of less than 20%. Since 1973, there's been an eight-fold increase in the incidence of this cancer in all adults in the U.S. That's a ten-fold increase actually in men. However, well less than 1% of all patients with Barrett's will progress to this cancer. The good news is that there are treatments available to prevent esophageal cancer in patients with Barrett's esophagus, but these are not cost effective for all Barrett's patients. 
In fact, there's significant peer review literature that questions both the efficacy and cost effectiveness of all the surveillance taking place since very few of these patients actually progress. The clinical area is crying out for a precision medicine test that pinpoints the patients at greatest risk for progression. The tissue cipher Barrett's esophagus assay was designed, developed, and validated as the first precision medicine test to predict development of esophageal cancer in patients with Barrett's. Tissue cipher is an LDT that evaluates the expression of nine specific protein biomarkers in the context of tissue architecture from esophageal biopsies taken during, the upper, during upper GI endoscopies. The test has been validated in five independent clinical studies from leading medical centers in the U.S. and Europe. Most recently, we completed a blinded validation study with Cleveland Clinic and the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center showing the ability of the test to identify high-risk, non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus patients that are five times more likely to progress to cancer within five years versus the low-risk class. The study reconfirmed the performance of tissue cipher that was observed in previous studies. The test identifies high-risk Barrett's patients likely to progress to esophageal cancer, enables optimized treatment and surveillance of patients with Barrett's, and provides an opportunity to improve adherence to clinical guidelines and appropriate utilization of limited healthcare resources in this clinical area. On this slide, you see two clinical examples of the test in practice. On each half of the slide, you see an image from the upper GI on the top left, the standard H&E image on the right, and four tissue sections undergoing tissue cipher analysis below. The patient on the left progressed to high-grade dysplasia almost seven years after the baseline endoscopy. Tissue cipher was able to correctly identify this patient as a progressor by evaluating this baseline biopsy. The patient on the right half of the slide is a non-progressor patient that scored low risk by tissue cipher and had more than seven years of progression-free surveillance. The biomarker expression patterns of these two patients are dramatically different, and the information is incorporated into a simple risk class and risk score provided in the clinical report. During an upper GI endoscopy uh, of a patient with Barrett's, the gastroenterologist will collect uh, tissue, um, uh, multiple biopsies from the affected tissue. Uh, in this schematic on the far left here, it's a, a rough outline of the esophagus and, and uh, the stomach. So the GI doctor is going to take multiple biopsies from the affected Barrett's tissue. Clinical guidelines recommend biopsies every one to two centimeters along the length of the Barrett's, and these biopsies then undergo tissue cipher analysis. Tissue cipher testing evaluates FFPE biopsies of the esophagus removed during the upper GI endoscopy. Workflow begins with multiplexed immunofluorescence slide labeling for nine protein-based biomarkers plus fluorescence labeling of nuclei. The labeled slides are then digitized by whole slide fluorescence scanning. Slide images are then analyzed by automated image analysis software that segments individual cells, subcellular compartments, and tissue structures, then extracts quantitative continuous measures of the nine biomarkers. These biomarker measurements are termed features, and 15 features selected in our initial training for tissue cipher serve as input into a risk prediction algorithm that produces a risk score that ranges from zero to 10 and risk classes of low, intermediate, and high risk for progression to cancer within five years. This MAAA test incorporates multiple biopsy levels as necessary from each patient and reports a single risk score and risk class. This slide is a reminder for our benefit at Cernostics to evaluate potential crosswalk candidates currently priced on the clinical lab fee schedule as there may be multiple comparable tests. We understand this and developed a rationale to follow these regulations. Our rationale for selecting the most comparable MAAA was as follows. The current clinical lab fee schedule includes 71 potential crosswalk candidates. We then filtered this list to select protein-based assays, dropping this to eight. Further filtering by tests for cancer prognosis in a similar range of analytes brings us to CPT 81538. Crosswalk to CPT 81538 is appropriate based on similarities in function and resource utilization. Each of these tests provide protein-based analysis, evaluate cancer risk prediction and prognosis, evaluate a similar number of biomarkers, and use the test method of an MAAA reporting as risk class and or risk score. In summary, 
Code 0108U is a new PLA code identifying the tissue cipher assay. This LDT is a precision medicine test that predicts development of esophageal cancer in patients with Barrett's esophagus, a highly prevalent condition affecting 5.6% of U.S. adults and a major risk factor for developing esophageal cancer. We recommend a crosswalk to 81538 since both of these tests are advanced, complex, protein-based MAAAs used for prognosis in cancer, utilize eight and nine protein signatures respectively, and provide the same type of information as other prognostic tests in prostate and breast cancer. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to address any questions you may have. Any questions from those on the line? We'll be moving on to our next presenter. Thank you. Autogenomics. Hi, how are you? Good morning. You can just progress with that one. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to the group today. Uh, I'm Kerry Donaldson. I'm the CEO, Chief Executive Officer of Autogenomics, as well as Prescient Medicine. We're in the room today to talk about a diagnostic test, an LDT, that we've been developing over the last seven and a half years. This particular diagnostic test focuses on a fairly large problem, the opioid use disorder. Um, I think everybody in the room understands that despite many, many people talking about the magnitude of this issue, there is a need for additional clinical testing. Our test can be integrated within the preoperative, perioperative, and postoperative pain assessment protocols that would allow objective versus subjective risk assessment. Sorry. Really what we focused on was physicians are currently relying on self-reported questionnaires where the risk assessed is subjective. Clinical studies have shown the subjective risk assessment can vary by 30 to 50 percent identifying patients that could be at risk versus not at risk, about as likely as flipping a coin. Not a very good thing to, to talk about um, when you're trying to figure out if somebody's going to develop an opioid use disorder. The genetics have been shown in our studies and previous studies to attribute up to about 70% of overall risk. Prescient as well as Autogenomics partnered to develop this test. It was given a breakthrough designation by the FDA last fall. Prescient Medicine and Autogenomics have validated this test in multiple independent studies, including the largest cohort ever to date, in conjunction with NIDA and the NIH. We recommend that our test be crosswalked directly to 81226. It is based upon a direct comparison between the methodologies and the numbers of SNPs in between that test and our diagnostic. At this point, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions from those on the line? Thank you. Thank you. Ethos Laboratory, presentation 13. Hi, any progress? Just push it up. It goes forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good morning. Thank you. I have two codes to present today uh, zero. 116U and 0117U. We'll start with 0117U. It is a uh, trip MAAA uh, assay that looks at 11 endogenous analytes and produces a predictive score for the likelihood of atypical biochemical function associated with pain. We recommend a crosswalk to uh, 81490 uh, due to its similarity. As a background, as I said earlier, it's an objective standardized pain index that quantitates 11 urine biomarkers tested with uh, LCMS MS, uh, run through a synthetic formula or algorithm that segregates the biomarkers by clinical and biochemical discriminant analysis and determines the likelihood of atypical biochemistry as a potential cause of pain. This in turn provides a physician with information to, to initiate targeted non-opioid therapy for the chronic pain population. 
This test generates uh, a report of low likelihood all the way up to high likelihood, which allows the uh, physician to determine uh, whether or not a non-opioid treatment could be an option for treating this patient. Test methodology pre-analytical is a urine collected uh, along with full demographics from a physician's office, sample shipped to Ethos Laboratories, uh, run on LCMSMS, uh, run through the algorithm, and a report with trend and repeat analysis following clinical evaluation. This algorithm was trained with over, over 50,000 clinical samples, uh, determines the 11 biomarkers of chronic pain and normalizes them. Uh, these biomarkers are loaded into the algorithm, um, uh, analyzed by regression analysis to generate the synthetic algorithm that most distinguishes chronic pain biosignatures from the healthy population. Output is likelihood of atypical biochemistry as cause of pain. Here's the discrimination of the uh, foundation PI with a relatively small patient subset, uh, 13 matched controls to 34 chronic pain patients. Uh, had 100% discrimination among this group. Again, this is the uh, crosswalk recommendation by us. Comparing the two side by side, number of analytes for both is 12, uh, both MAAAs, uh, prognostic, CLIA complexity is high, specialty classes chemistry uh, in sample prep uh, is longer here, but uh, just shows a comparison. Any questions? For some Any questions? The next code is 0116U, uh, prescription drug monitoring uh, with, in oral fluid, 35 or more drugs confirmed. Uh, recommendation is to cr direct crosswalk to 0051U as it's consistent with the uh, descriptor. Code name is snapshot oral fluid compliance test, uh, prescription drug monitoring. Quantitate at least 35 drug levels using uh, LCMSMS. Uh, algorithmic snapshot uh, employs LCMSMS data, reports compliance and potential drug to drug interactions, and provides physician with information for informed pain medication prescribing. Uh, this is an oral fluid collection uh, run on LCMSMS, uh, along, and then a report is sent to the provider. Comparing the two, uh, 0116U to 0051U, number of drugs similar, instrumentation similar, complexity similar, specialty class same, sample matrix same. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions from those on the line? Thank you. Uh, BioFire presenter number 14. My name is Wade Stevenson. I'm the Senior Vice President of Global Marketing at BioFire Diagnostics. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, there are four codes, uh, four new PLA codes that uh, BioFire uh, is discussing today. That we are recommending a gap fill analysis for all four of these codes. Syndromic infectious disease testing is the broad grouping of multiple probable pathogens associated with a particular syndrome into one test. Got started about uh, over a decade ago. It was readily adopted by the infectious disease and microbiology communities in our great nation. And our payers in the United States uh, paid it and I think valued it appropriately at the time. But those early technologies are rapidly becoming obsolete. 
They were very complex, difficult for laboratories to implement, required uh, purchasing and acquiring multiple instruments and validating them, and then required hours of hands-on time, of uh, technical time. And uh, that led to a pretty high reimbursement rate. But those days are gone. Newer technologies, such as BioFire, are now available that streamline the process and automate it, uh, get it down to two minutes of hands-on time, and reduce the turnaround time from 10 to 12 hours down to an hour, uh, greatly increasing the clinical value. As you look at these new PLA codes, you're going to be very tempted to crosswalk them to the old CPT codes. I would caution you not to do that. That will lead to reimbursement rates that are based on that old technology. That was very costly and hard to impl implement. We're recommending a gap fill analysis because we believe those old rates are too high. We feel additionally that those old rates were based largely on the number of targets, number of pathogenic targets in those panels. And we feel that the value of syndromic infectious disease testing does not rest on the number of targets, but rather the right list of targets. And more and more importantly, on the turnaround time at which you're able to get the answers to the right people. Our technology has been around for not quite seven, eight years. We're, it's used on millions of patients uh, across the United States. And there are over 150 published papers supporting its clinical use and showing benefits over standard of care testing. So for each of these codes, 0097U, 0098U, 0099U, and 0100U, we're recommending a gap fill analysis that takes into account the evolution of the underlying technologies used to produce these results. Uh, I think we're at a, a, a crossroads in the development of this technology where we have a very unique opportunity to do the right thing by lowering the cost, not only to patients, but to payers, and to hopefully increase access to this new and very promising technology that has already been widely shown uh, to have tremendous clinical benefit and has been widely adopted in the US and continues to be widely, widely adopted. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, any questions from those on the line? And we'll be moving on to speaker number 15, Mayo Clinic. Good morning, I'm Cheryl James from Mayo Clinic, and we've got quite a few codes, as you can see on the list, so I will jump right in. The first one is 0070U, which is the CYP2D6, uh, common and rare variants. We're asking for a crosswalk for that one to 81226, which is the, C the CYP2D6 common variants, but at 1.5 times. This reflects that this assay is run as a two-sequence assay um, to look at both that common and rare variant. Uh, this will account for the work and the resources required. 0071U through 0076U are all add-on codes to the 0070U. Um, so I'm going to discuss these all as a group because we're crosswalking them all to the same CPT of 81238, um, which is the F9 gene. 
We're crosswalking it to F9 based on the number of exons. F9 has eight exons. SEP2D6 has nine exons. Very similar work and resources. 0071U through 0076U are add-on codes. Basically, they're add-on codes for those times when you have the ambiguous uh, genotype for the CYP2D6. So these aren't run all of the time. Only about 3% of the time will you need to go on to an 0071U through that 0076U. Um, doesn't necessarily mean you'll only add on one. You may have instances of times where you may have to add on additional ones. The most we've ever had to add on is three at this point in time. And we don't expect that to change. Brings us to 0077U, which is an immuno, immunoglobulin paraprotein for the M proteins. Basically, we're recommending a gap fill on this one. Even though there are several CPT codes that we could crosswalk this to, it would be a crosswalk to several additive CPT codes. There's not a single CPT code that describes this novel and new technology. To look at um, the monoclonal gammopathies um, by use of the mass spec, Therefore, a gap fill is really the most appropriate way to look at this at this point in time. The next six codes are all drug codes. <clears throat> and I'm going to take these in two groups of three. So we've got adalimumab, infliximab, and vedolizumab. These are all drugs that are used for Crohn's or um, ulcerative, ulcerative colitis. Um, these are all codes that use the same technology, the LCMSMS. Um, we're crosswalking it to CPT code 80155, which is the CPT code for caffeine. Um, this reflects the resources, the work that is required to do these three therapeutic drug assays. The next three are lecosamide, posiconazole, and voriconazole. Again, we're crosswalking all three of these to the same CPT code of 80199, Tiagabin, based on the work and the resources required. Even though these three drugs all have different clinical indications, it's still that methodology, the resources that are comp comparable to Tiagabin. The next code is the cytogenomic um, microarray for neoplasia. We're asking for a crosswalk for that one to 81229. 81229 is the CGH for congenital disorders. 81229 really reflects the same methodology, the same technique. It's just that you're looking at constitutional versus neoplasia. Therefore, 81229 is the most appropriate crosswalk code for this new CGH for neoplasia. 0119U is a new marker for cardiology um, that'll give you a risk score for major cardiovascular events. Uh, we're asking for a crosswalk to two codes on this one, 82542, which represents the methodology of the LCMSMS, plus 83698, which is also an analyte specific CPT code for LP. PLA2, which is another cardiovascular uh, risk marker. Uh, we feel that both of these codes describe the work that's involved based on the methodology, the number of plasma ceramides we're looking at to produce that risk score. Because as you can see, we're actually doing six plasma ceramide scores to get to our risk. Our final code is 0120, which is an oncology B cell lymphoma classification. We're looking at a crosswalk to, on this one to 81520. The assay is run on the exact same platform, has the same number of genes that are being analyzed in 81520. Therefore, 81520 is the most appropriate for a crosswalk. Any questions?
Any questions from those on the line? Okay, we'll be moving on to our next presenter. Prisoner 16, Laboratory for Personalized Molecular Medicine. Hello, my name is Jordan Thornis from the Lab PMM. I'm here to discuss two codes, but the arguments for both codes will be identical. So the first code is code 0046U. It is a FOOT3 mutation assay for the purposes of minimal residual disease detection. Uh, it is similar in properties to code 81245 as they target the same biomarker, but the purpose of each code is different, and the methodology is between what's typically done for 81245 and what's done for our PLA code are much different, and the resources required to do our tests are much different. As you can see, the analytical sensitivity of the, uh, our PLA code, 80046U, is far more sensitive than your typical FOOT3 test. And the purpose is different. A typical FOOT3 test is done at diagnosis or at relapse for uh, prognostic purposes. However, this test is intended to be used uh, during treatment and after treatment for the purpose of detecting minimal residual disease in the patient, which is a known um, and becoming rapidly more widely used prognostic marker during treatment. So it is also the same argument for the MPM1 uh, MRD assay we have as well. Again, far more sensitive than the typical code and the resources and methodology um, required is quite a bit different than code 81310. So for both codes, we're recommending a gap fill instead of crosswalk. Thank you. Are there any questions? Any questions for those on the line? Okay, we'll move on to our next presenter. Prisoner 17, your offense. Hi, my name is Terrence Hallahan. I'm the laboratory director for Eurofins NTD Labs. I'm going to be presenting on uh, five MA codes today. Um, all five of these codes are basically subsets of the same six analytes. So I'm going to focus on uh, 0126U, uh, which is the only one that uses all six analytes. And then all the other codes pretty much fall uh, from there. Uh, so we'll be looking at five serum analytes, free beta ACG, PAPA, AFP, PLGF, and inhibin, uh, and then uh, uh, a presence of Y chromosome test uh, as a cell-free DNA test. So for 0126U, uh, uh, this screens for Down syndrome, uh, trisomy 1813, and early onset preeclampsia. Uh, the analytes... Uh, free beta HCG, PAPA, AFP, and inhibin already have uh, existing CPT codes, so we're recommending a crosswalk directly with those. PLGF uh, does not have its own CPT code, uh, but it is an immunoassay similar to uh, inhibin, so we are uh, suggesting a crosswalk of PLGF to inhibin. Uh, for a total cost of 16033. And here's the presence of Y. Uh, so looking at the uh, PLGF assay, uh, technically this is similar to uh, most of the sandwich ELISA assays that are used in maternal serum screening. We start with a streptavidin immuno, immunoplate. It's followed with a biotinylated FAB fragment to PLGF. Uh, PLGF in the sample then, then binds to the FAB fragment. Uh, the sample is washed, and then we follow with a europium tracer. Uh, after the addition of an enhancement solution, europium is released, and the fluorescence is proportional to the amount of PLGF in the antigen. We're crosswalking this to inhibin because while most immunoassays uh, have an antibody bound directly to the plate, uh, this has an additional step uh, in, in binding to a streptavidin plate. Uh, inhibin also has an, an additional step uh, where the the sample needs to be oxidized, so it also has an additional reagent and an additional step. Uh, for the presence of Y chromosome, and I'm sorry, there's 
Uh, one of there's a problem with this slide in that there's a, a presence of why uh, that's missing. Uh, the presence of why. Uh, we take a, a separate tube from the maternal serum analytes. Uh, we, we get a streck tube and we isolate the uh, cell-free DNA. Uh, we then do uh, an endpoint analysis of real-time PCR, uh, looking at the SYR gene. We have a forward and reverse primers and, and a probe. Uh, and for housekeeping, we use GAPDH gene. Uh, and in this case, because it's, it's endpoint analysis, we're simply looking at uh, the signal that we get in the end. Uh, so we're, it's, it's a yes, no, either the, the, the Y is present or it is not. Uh, the reason that we look for Y uh, in doing this test is that we are using it to adjust the maternal serum markers. Uh, for years, maternal serum markers are just, have been adjusted based on maternal weight, maternal race, maternal smoking status, uh, maternal diabetic status, uh, and we've also known that uh, the maternal serum markers vary based on fetal gender. However, until recently, there was no way in the first trimester to really accurately determine gender. Now using DNA technology, we can do that. Uh, and you can see, for instance, free beta HCG, uh, a female fetus has almost a 15% increase uh, in the amount of fetal uh, uh, free beta HCG. Uh, in Down syndrome patients, it's almost a 20-fold increase. Uh, PAPA in unaffected pregnancies is about six times greater in female pregnancies, uh, similarly in Down syndrome pregnancies. Uh, and even in the biophysical markers, uh, such as nuchal translucency, uh, there are differences uh, with, with females being about 10% lower in unaffected pregnancies and, and about 9% lower in uh, Down syndrome. Uh, pregnancies. So because of these differences, a female fetus is 1.08 times more likely to be increased risk uh, than, than a male fetus. Uh, and the detection rate is 88.8 .8 in the presence of a male fetus versus 91.2 in a female fetus. By performing these adjustments, we're, we're able to give a more personalized risk assessment, uh, and this helps to remove the gender bias uh, in prenatal screening. Uh, so, looking at 0126U, uh, it combines free beta, PAPA, AFP, PLGF, and inhibin. These are adjusted for Y chromosome. Uh, we also include nuchal translucency and nasal bone, uh, uterine artery Doppler, mean arterial pressure, and BMI. Uh, there are then three separate risk algorithms that are run, one for Down syndrome, uh, which gets a 1.2% uh, false positive rate and 98% detection efficiency. Uh, one for trisomy 18 and 13, which at a 0.5% false positive rate detects 95% of trisomy 18 13s. And one for early onset preeclampsia, uh, which gets a 5% false positive rate and a 91% uh, detection efficiency. Uh, screening for early onset preeclampsia is, is actually new uh, to, to the field. Uh, why do we want to screen for early onset preeclampsia? Uh, one, it's, uh, it, it's highly prevalent. Uh, preeclampsia affects five to seven and a half percent of all pregnancies. Uh, it's extremely expensive. Uh, it costs about $6.4 billion a year uh, to care for the mother and baby uh, in, in these cases. And although the early onset form of the disease is a small subset, it's about 10 or 15 percent of all cases of preeclampsia, but it represents about 50 percent of the total health care costs. And that's primarily because the cost of taking care of these, these preterm babies uh, that are born extremely early. Uh, so it makes sense to screen for this condition in order to help to try to prevent uh, the morbidity and mortality that is associated with it. Um, Moreover, we now know that if we can detect early onset preeclampsia or predict it in the first trimester, that we can actually help prevent it with the administration of low-dose aspirin. Uh, this was a randomized control trial published by the Fetal Medicine Foundation uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine in uh, 2007. Uh, so they looked at about 36,000 pregnancies. They screened using a protocol uh, essentially identical to ours. Uh, that included uh, 
maternal demographic characteristics, uterine artery Doppler pulsatility index, mean arterial pressure, maternal serum, uh, PAPE and PLGF. Uh, the only difference with our protocol is that we also add a maternal serum AFP. Those patients that were found to be at increased risk using uh, this risk algorithm were then put into a randomized control trial of either 150 milligrams of aspirin or placebo. And what they found was when they looked at the early onset preeclampsia, those patients that delivered prior to 34 weeks due to preeclampsia, there were 15 cases in the placebo group and there were only three in the aspirin group. That represented an 80% reduction in the prevalence of early onset preeclampsia. Uh, by screening, followed by aspirin administration to those who are at increased risk. Uh, if they looked at those that delivered less than 37 weeks, there were 35 in the placebo, 13 in the aspirin, that represented a 63% reduction. Um, so not quite as good as looking at the very early cases. And if they looked at term preeclampsia, there was only a 15% reduction and it wasn't statistically significant. So. What they proved in this study is that, one, they can very effectively screen for early onset preeclampsia, and that they can prevent it with the administration of low-dose aspirin, and that aspirin is far more effective on early onset preeclampsia than it is on uh, term preeclampsia. Uh, it is now recommended by the International Society of Ultrasound and Obstetrics and Gynecology uh, to do a combined screening approach, followed by aspirin administration. Uh, and by the International Federation of Gynecologists and Obst uh, Obstetrics, uh, again, to screen using uh, a combined modality followed by low-dose aspirin administration. Um, so looking at our other markers for 0, 1, 2, 4, uh, we're recommending crosswalks of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, this is our standard first trimester Down syndrome screening protocol on dry blood. Uh, there are existing codes for free beta, PAPE, and AFP, and we are recommending crosswalk directly to those codes. Uh, for uh, 0125U, uh, this is an expanded uh, Down syndrome and preeclampsia screen uh, without the adjustment for Y. Uh, so we're recommending crosswalks uh, directly to free beta, PAPE, and inhibin, and again, PLGF to crosswalk to uh, 86336. Uh, 127U, uh, this is a preeclampsia only screen. Sorry. Yes, time's up. Okay. And that's it. Any questions for those in person? Hi, this is Karen again. Uh, quick question. So, you, your codes are PLA codes? Yes. So, and, and they're, so they're, technically, are they, well, are, when you said they were MA codes, was the goal to resubmit applications to get CAT1, AMA, CPT CAT1 codes, MA codes, or are they PLA codes? Well, I, I think they're, they're, they're both, they're, it's a PLA MA, MA code. But by AMA CPT definition, uh, I, I don't believe PLA codes are MA codes. They can, well, okay, so let me rephrase my question. So your code has an algorithm in it. Yes. And that is what you believe to make it a MA code. Yes. Okay, thanks. Any question for those on the phone? Okay, thank you. Next presenter, presenter number 18, Viracor. All right, thank you. My name is Michelle Altrich. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer and the Clinical Lab Director at Viracor. And I'm here today to present to you the um, plan for code 0118U. The descriptor is transplantation medicine, quantification of donor-derived cell-free DNA using whole genome next-generation sequencing from plasma reported as a percentage of donor-derived cell-free DNA. Our re request is to crosswalk this to CPT code 81595, 
which had a 2019 clinical lab fee schedule payment of $3,240. The rationale is that both of these are molecular assays that look at post-transplant rejection. Both methods include isolation of nucle nucleic acid. The reference test performs 20 real-time PCR analysis via an algorithm, and our current test looks at whole genome sequencing along with the genotype data and evaluates the percentage utilizing bioinformatics algorithm. For additional reference, we can look to test 10969 Alisher, which was paid under the MULDX program using an LCD price in 2017 of $2,840.75. And in this case, both of these tests use next generation sequencing to accurately quantify donor-derived cell-free DNA in transplant recipients. Allosure uses 216, 266 SNPs, while it does not genotype either the donor or the recipient, while our test utilizes unbiased genome sequencing in genome-wide recipient genotype data. And this slide just shows a descriptor indication in a description of the procedure. Are there any questions? Yes. I think you're supposed to go to that. This, this pertains to a particular organ or, or, or is it across organs? Yes, yeah, so there are um, distinct orderable codes for each organ. But uh, through discussions with the PLA group, they suggested we combine it into one PLA code, since the procedure is the same for all organs. Thank you. Are there any questions from those on the line? If not, we'll move on to our next presenter. Presenter 19, intro track. Thank you. I'm Stephen Ackerman. I'm the CSO for Enterotrack LLC. Uh, we're talking about code 0095U which is a test for eosinophilic esophagitis uh, based on obtaining a liquid biopsy through a capsule device called an enterotracker, which contains a nylon string. And the test reads out an algorithm that's reported as a probability index for active eosinophilic esophagitis. We're requesting a crosswalk to 81539, which is a high-grade prostate cancer assay, which has four proteins and a biochemical assay, and also a prognostic algorithm, probab probability score, but our test is more complex than this test. The uh, code name for this is uh, the esophageal string test. Uh, the test itself quantitates two eosinophil-associated protein biomarkers in the uh, string test captured liquid biopsy. Those are eotaxin-3, or CCL26, and an eosinophil-specific protein, major basic protein-1. And the test is performed using a CAP-CLIA-certified series of two ELISAs for these biomarkers performed by a CRO. And we obtain an EOE score from the levels of these two biomarkers, which is a statistical algorithm uh, based on the ELISA-determined protein concentrations. And this is the probability of a patient having mucosal inflammation indica indicative of e active eosinophilic esophagitis. And would, this would normally, in terms of a biopsy test, correspond to greater than 15 peak eosinophils per high-powered field in, an in the epithelium of esophageal biopsies. And this is a correlate, therefore, of mucosal eosinophilic inflammation in EOE. Uh, the test represents an, a minimally invasive surrogate to replace the repeat sedated endoscopies with biopsies that are currently used in children and in adults 
to monitor EOE patient responses during treatment. So the test purpose is to detect the presence of esophageal mucosal eosinophilic inflammation, and if you have a positive test, that means you have a high probability of having the active disease. And the GI or the allergist can review this information and make treatment decisions, or if there is not diagnosed EOE but suspected EOE, then the physician can um, uh, trigger a uh, referral for endoscopy and biopsy for confirmation. If you have a negative test and you are undergoing a food elimination diet, that means it was successful and you can start refood challenges and add back foods, up to six different foods. Uh, if it's negative, then you can add another food. Uh, or if you're under treatment with swallowed topical corticosteroids, it can demonstrate whether or not that treatment is being effective. Whether it's negative or positive, the uh, test, uh, the esophageal string test, safely avoids the costs and risks of repeated sedated endoscopies with biopsy to monitor patients during treatment. The test method in terms of pre-analytical is to perform a one-hour esophageal string test using the device called the EnteroTracker. Then the string that's in the esophagus is harvested and it's packaged using a kit and frozen and shipped overnight for uh, these biomarker immunoassays to the CR CRO. Uh, analytically, the string is eluded by the CRO, so the uh, sample is eluded from the string and then the LDTs are performed. And then that involves a series of uh, two ELISAs, both eight-point calibration and three quality controls. And after analysis, there's a lab review, and the um, values are put into this uh, algorithm, which reports out the EOE score as a probability of active eosinophilic esophagitis, as I mentioned earlier. And this provides uh, some clinical guidance for physician use of the EOE score. The algorithm itself, uh, is calculated uh, statistically. It's based on a uh, FDA-funded validation study of 134 patients for this rare disease. Um, and as I said, it's based on concentrations of two of the biomarkers. If, if the probability ranges from zero to one of a patient having the equivalent of 15 uh, peak eosinophils per high-powered field, this is a, a clinical pathologic standard for this disease. Um, that's currently used to identify active e inflammation in EOE. If you have a score of uh, 0.53 or greater, that represents a high likelihood that your patient has active eosinophilic esophagitis. Sensitivity and specificity are, sh are shown. Uh, so the EOE score is then used in conjunction with other clinical findings as a tool to aid in monitoring EOE patients during the various kinds of treatments that are available to them, be they food elimination, and reintroduction or um, uh, elemental diet or topical swallowed glucocorticoids. The cost of the test uh, range from as much as 7,000 down to about 209, depending on the number of samples that can be analyzed and batched together. Um, and that includes all the costs associated with sample processing and the two protein biomarker ELISAs. It doesn't include any of the costs of the dedicated components shown here, the capsule, uh, the collection kits, or transport on dry ice to the CRO for immunoassay. And it doesn't, inc and uh, uh, of course there are costs associated with sales and marketing, and everybody knows the CMS will only reimburse about 80% of the cost. So we're recommending a crosswalk to test code 81539, which has four protein biomarkers versus our two, um, which would be billed under a PLA code of 0095U. The rationale here is that our two-protein ELISA prognostic algorithm test is consistent with the code descriptor for this four-protein biochemical assay and prognostic algorithm, but our test is much more complex. So it involves two independent immunoassays, which are not biochemical assays. It requires the addition of protease inhibitors to the string samples before testing. It requires the CRO to elute the liquid biopsy from the string. And it also requires a two-hour sample reduction and alkylation step for one of the biomarkers. Also, we need a rapid turnaround time for results reporting, uh, which increases cost per sample depending on the number of samples that one can batch uh, for sample elution and the ELISA immunoassays. And finally, we're talking about uh, diagnostic here for a, a rare disease prevalence of about 4 in 10,000 patient subjects. 
uh, and there are about 180,000 patients currently in the U.S. And I'll stop here and I'll take questions. Thank you. Any questions from those on the line? If not, we'll move on to the next presenter. Thank you. Presenter 20, Meg Array Incorporated. Hi, my name is Louis Carbonell, representing Magare, and I'm here to talk about uh, code 0092U, uh, which is for oncology lung, three protein biomarkers. It's a type of immunoassay using a magnetic nanosensor nano technology. We use plasma as a matrix, and the algorithm is reported as a risk score for likelihood of malignancy. We're recommending a crosswalk to 81538 uh, because rationale is one that there's a similar disease indication in lung cancer. Uh, the underlying magnetic nanosensor technology is uh, at least, an, I would argue, more complex than the crosswalk code, and it provides assessment of malignancy to help reduce the need for risky, costly interventions. Uh, for the test purpose and method, I won't go into the general description of lung cancer other than to say that over 150,000 people die in the U.S. each year of lung cancer and that right now somebody who's diagnosed with lung cancer has about a 17 percent five-year survival rate. Lung cancer is usually identified initially through the screening uh, for pulmonary lung nodules and the problem with pulmonary lung nodules is that indeterminate pulmonary lung nodules that are detected by screening or by imaging pose a very significant clinical, advantage, uh, clinical challenge. The main goal when evaluating indeterminate pulmonary nodules is to expedite treatment of the malignant nodules and to minimize procedures for benign nodules. About 96 percent of the intermediate uh, pulmonary nodules are benign. Uh, so uh, an accurate, non-invasive, and easily administered test is very much needed to better, assist, better assess the risk of malignancy to help reduce the overdiagnosis and overtreatment of non-cancerous uh, pulmonary nodules. Our test has demonstrated efficacy in accurately identifying patients at low risk of lung cancer to help rule out the need for costly and uh, aggressive interventions. And the test has the potential to support a more informed clinical decision about performing uh, uh, an invasive evaluation of the patient's lung nodule. Let's see. Since this is a uh, relatively unfamiliar technology, I think it's worthwhile to go into uh, some uh, general introduction of the technology. Uh, we use a custom PCB assembly that's made specially for us and, and for this purpose. We have two instruments uh, that are custom built for running this test, one that does most of the assay uh, steps on it, the second instrument, which, is, which handles the uh, detection and the, the actual readout of the uh, biomarker signals. Uh, that information is put into uh, a complex algorithm that uses a support vector machine uh, uh, algorithm to be able to then prepare a final score that uh, gives the doctor the, chance, the uh, probability of malignancy of that patient. The manufacturing and QC processes are quite complex. We start out with uh, silicon wafers that have a special GMR giant magnetoresistance layer put on top of them. Uh, they are then patterned into sensors that are individually cut out and put onto the custom boards that I showed earlier. Uh, we have multiple sensors on each individual chip, uh, and then we also employ uh, special magnetic nanoparticles which 
uh, during the point of, during part of the assay come in close proximity to the sensors and are measured and, and give the ROS signal that we measure. The cost of the test is comparable to the crosswalk code. Uh, there's been over a decade and close to $100 million, including some key funding from uh, the NCI in the form of SBIR grants, uh, spent on developing the GMR magnetic nanosensor technology, uh, all for detecting a biochemical signal in a small blood sample using a solid state electronic device. It's a key innovation in driving the ultra-sensitive detection of subtle changes in plasma proteins that can help alert physicians to a biochemical change uh, that's associated to lung cancer. This test itself uh, has a negative predictive value of 94%, so it's shown good potential as a rule-out test, uh, and that helps to reduce invasive diagnostic procedures that may otherwise result in significant complication rates and costs. Uh, here's uh, some further explanation of some of the costs and complication rates associated with lung cancer. Uh, there was a very large study done uh, around 2010 by the uh, national, it was called the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial, which looked at over 50,000 patients. And uh, through that study, there were some rates of complications for surgery, bronchoscopy, and biopsy, uh, which are all uh, follow-up steps to when a nodule is found. And there was a more recent study in 2019 that was published in JAMA Internal Medicine, which looked at the rates that were found in the NLST study and compared them to rates seen in actual community practice. And you can see uh, here, comparing the blue and the green, that rates in community practice are oftentimes twice as high uh, for the different procedures. The cost of complications range from uh, major, intermediate, and minor. Uh, but even the minor costs of complications can be uh, quite large. So anything that could be done, especially using a test such as ours, to reduce those costs or to eliminate those costs by identifying benign nodules earlier and, and helping avoid those procedures would be a, a great benefit. So because of that, uh, I go back to we uh, recommend a crosswalk to 81538. Uh, and for the rationale that's, that's here. Uh, any questions? Any questions for those on the line? Great, we'll move on to our next presenter. Singulex. Uh, good morning. My name is actually Darren Lee. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer for Singulex. Jeff Bishop, unfortunately, couldn't make it today. Um, I'm here today, along with my colleague Akash Bijani, to talk about 0107U, a Singulex Clarity C. diff toxins AB assay. This is for the detection of Clostridium difficile, and I'll explain a little bit further about the test um, and a little bit more about the technology. Like my previous speaker, uh, we wanted to just cover the technology briefly to explain to you a little bit about how it works because it's fairly unique and many of you in the room may not be as familiar with the technology. So we use a technology called single molecule counting. It's actually a, a very robust technology that's been around for about 10 years, uh, particularly in the life science market and then came into diagnostics over the last couple of years. And we use confocal lasers uh, and a detection system to actually count uh, single photons and actually single molecules for biomarker detection, whether that is in disease um, and uh, could be in uh, um, cardiovascular disease, could be in infectious disease. Um, and this technology has been around for a, a little while and now we've actually automated into a full sample to answer system known as the Clarity system. The reason why we're able to um, get the performance from the technology, uh, as you'll see in a second, is because we're able to uh, detect at very low levels uh, biomarker changes. So detecting the differences between healthy individuals and diseased individuals uh, is uh, an application of the technology. This allows us also, because of the, the technology, to do actually digital counting of the technology and of the assays. And this results in very high sensitivity, and also we also have a very large dynamic range, up to seven logs, 
So we're able to not only detect at very low levels changes in biomarker concentration, but also we're able to have a large linear range and be able to, check, to, to, to test uh, molecules that are very similar to regular immunoassays as well. So what we've been able to do with our C. diff assay is um, C. diff and CDI uh, disease in general has been a huge problem for institutions um, over the years. And um, despite some of the IDSA guidelines and SHEA guidelines uh, recommended maybe an algorithm or actually running two tests, we feel our test now, now is able to uh, run uh, as a single test uh, to be able to detect uh, Clostridium difficile. We don't have the issues because of our sensitivity of immunoassays. Um, and also because of our specificity, we don't have the issue that a number of PCR tests have, which can be overcalling uh, patients as being CDI when in fact they're just colonized with the gene and don't have uh, actually the toxin producing genes. Our intended use is the same as others that are on the market, and that is to be used in the aid of the diagnosis of uh, Clostridium difficile. So it's very similar to what else uh, and other uh, technologies that are on the market right now. This is the system, it's a full sample to answer system. Uh, really focused on uh, a lot of medium to high throughput laboratories who have a large number of, of C. diff uh, tests that they're completing on a daily basis. You basically put your samples on, we have some consumables on board that will then take the sample through sample to answer. So to summarize why we feel this is a, um, another leap forward for um, CDI and C. diff testing, um, there's a couple of things that came out during our clinical trials. Uh, one was the, the sensitivity of the assay, and we feel that it delivers an ultra-sensitive uh, uh, performance, uh, which really uh, can detect very low levels of both toxin A and toxin B. In the case of immunoassay, we're uh, 10 times more sensitive than any other equivalent immunoassay that's on the market right now. In the terms of specificity, that's the other key contributor to this. Uh, we also have a, 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 a specificity that allows us to call out the disease associated with the toxin. So toxin A and toxin B being measured is actually, we feel, a better indication of the disease than running something like a PCR where you're just detecting the gene of the disease. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague Akash now, who's going to talk a little bit about the, the patient and clinical effects. Thank you, Darren. Really appreciate it. Um, on this slide, you'll see that there are many different patient and clinical benefits associated with this C. diff assay. So in, if we look at it from an improved specificity perspective, there are three key improvements for patients and hospitals. First is decreasing of missed cases. So those are positive cases who actually return back to the institution. It also potentially reduces hospital readmissions. And as part of that, both the, there are potential reductions in the hack and VBP penalties, which C. diff is part of both of those. From an improved specificity perspective, it may decrease additional length of stay in the hospital. And in addition, it may also improve antibiotic stewardship, especially for patients who are being treated currently with C. diff, but who may actually not have the disease. Um, when we look at the cost of our treatment algorithm, um, we looked at it based on the, um, the Medicare PFS uh, fee schedule, and we looked at the equipment supplies and labor cost, um, as well as the 37% overhead, and you'll see our total cost comes to um, approximately $74. Um, and our recommendation in terms of uh, reimbursement is a crosswalk um, to 87803 uh, with a three multiplier. The reason for this is that our single X test um, includes both toxins A and toxins B. So there's one differentiator right there. We also have higher sensitivity um, and specificity compared to the current algorithm, being, uh, current assay being used. And as noted on the prior slide, we also have higher resource cost. The current resource cost um, based on the national um, average submitted fee based on 2017 data for CPT code 87803 is $45.20. Any questions? Thanks. 
Any questions from those on the line? We'll be moving on to our next presenter. Kashi Clinical Laboratories. Good morning, all of you. Uh, my name is Zara Kashi, uh, the Chief Executive Officer of Kashi Clinical Laboratories, and I am going to dial Dr. Philip Halloran uh, uh, onto this call and put him on a speakerphone on the mic. Uh, this is the best attempt we could do. Uh, uh, at the moment, he is actually across the street uh, uh, in, in uh, awaiting this. Hello. Uh, Dr. Oh, yes. yes, go ahead, please. Should I go ahead? Yes, please. Thank you. Are the slides on the screen? So I'm, I apologize for the inconvenience. I assume I'm being excluded because of the Raptors win in the NBA, but there may be other reasons. Uh, the, for years, clinicians have wanted better tests to diagnose uh, uh, rejection and injury in uh, transplant biopsies. Both pathologists and clinicians have called for this. Errors in assessment based on incorrect diagnoses can lead to death, graft loss, and inappropriate treatment. So the molecular microscope is a central diagnostic system that uniquely uses microarrays to measure messenger RNA expression in transplant biopsies to create an objective quantitative assessment. Slide two. The system uses predefined uh, machine learning algorithms to read the uh, significance of the uh, changes in gene expression. And then the X kidney takes the genome wide readouts and profiles 1,494 genes and reports the results 24 to 30, 30 hours. And then the X heart um, has the same strategy profiling 1,283 genes and reports the results in 48 to 64 hours. Slide three. The development of the system incorporates uh, many terms of basic science to interpret the results, including more than a thousand experimental organ uh, transplants in mice. Uh, it, the commitment, we've had a commitment to disease reclassification of the international consensus processes, and the system has basically been accepted in principle by the BAMP classification. But the essence of the system is experience with about 4,000 well-characterized human biopsies in prospective international studies using unsupervised and unsupervised approaches and using ensembles uh, to, re to create stability and accuracy in the reports. So the performance that I say is um, rapid and accurate, uh, assessing almost 100% of the biopsies received in and, um, and in addition, clinician feedback has indicated that it's um, significantly better than histology, which was the purpose. Moreover, the heart test has the ability to detect disturbance, disturbances in the biology underlying the ventricular function, which translates at a risk of survival, and histology can't do that. So we're presenting um, code 87U, the heart transplant test, as a gap fill test because it's a unique assay in the, the heart transplant biopsy based on gene expression and machine learning algorithms. Clinical validity has been established with respect to histology function, antibody status and outcomes in a series of publications in the inter-heart of a collaboration in anti international centers. So it takes genome-wide readouts and creates a report based on the expression of 20 scores representing the input from 100 different uh, machine learning algorithms. And that reflects rejection and injury states in the biopsy. 88U, uh, the kidney transplant test, it again is being presented as a gap fill. It's a unique assay for the reading the transplant uh, tissue sample based on gene expression and machine learning algorithms. Clinical validity has again been established with respect to histology and function and HLA antibody status and outcomes in a large series of papers in the Inter Intercomex international collaboration involving uh, 38 investigators in the United States and international centers. Again, the unique genome-wide um, readout is converted into a picture of the biology and the disease processes in the biopsy 
which reflect rejection and injury, incorporating 100 different algorithms and ensembles to provide 17 scores. We think it addresses an important unmet need um, and will have an impact on, uh, on transplant management. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Halloran. Um, are there any questions? Uh, yeah, again, uh, apologies for this. Um, the CMS had a regulation. Dr. Halloran is across the street, actually. He's a Canadian citizen and was not uh, allowed entry just because there were some documentations that, that we were not aware that had to be filled out ahead of time. He is graciously and gracefully awaiting. If there are any questions, please feel welcome to ask. Thank you. Any questions from those on the line? Okay, we'll move on to our next presenter, Amber Genetics. Hi. Hi. Just go ahead. Right there. Thank you very much. Good morning, Robert Gagli, representing Amber Genetics on behalf of the pricing recommendations for our 13 new PLA codes. I'd first like to bring your attention to this table uh, to help summarize the codes for the first set. I have grouped them in order to not spend the majority of the rest of your morning going over all 13 of these. They do come in three neat groups. The first one represents some genomic sequencing procedure panels. If you look at the first column in bold, that is the test name from Ambry Genetics, the number of genes that are sequenced, and the number of genes that are analyzed via deletion, duplication, and analysis. The row immediately following is a very close crosswalk to an existing genomic sequencing procedure panel, that being a hereditary uh, Lynch syndrome panel, 81435, and its accompanying deletion duplication analysis panel, 81436. The number of genes included in that panel at minimum and gene duplication uh, deletion analysis uh, uh, minimum requirements as well. And you'll see a similar pattern for each of the rows represented there. So all of the sections in the white are comparing our new PLA panels with existing GSP panel codes that are already in the code book. The column in gray on the right are additional procedures that AMBRI and, in general, molecular diagnostics experts would determine are required to analyze complex regions of genes included in these panels, yet are not represented in the current code book. Therefore, laboratories could choose to include them or choose to exclude them at will. AMBRI always includes them, therefore it's necessary to elucidate that in the coding infrastructure, hence the PLA code award from the AMA. These are some of the procedures and a brief description, or maybe not so brief, depending on how you look at it, as to why they would be performed. I won't go into all of the detail here, but suffice it to say that if you work in a molecular diagnostics laboratory, the regions, the genes, including PMS2, MLH2, uh, low quality reads, orthogonal confirmation, VUS resolution, uh, and deletion duplication analysis for complex areas are all known in molecular diagnostics in industry to many times require additional methodology, including Sanger, MLPA, array CGH, or mRNA analysis for the VUS portion in order to fully analyze the full genes and pseudogene regions that we're contemplating here with these tests. One example of an mRNA uh, analysis resolution in that VUSs had been resulted. These are splice site variants. You can see in the bar chart on the left, pre-RNA for splice site variants, large number of VUSs, and a couple of VLPs are very likely pathogenic reads. If you take them and run RNA analysis on all of them, the output of that is actually a useful or information that has clinical utility and the doctors can act on that being that they are reclassified, a large percentage of them too pathogenic and therefore extremely actionable, many of them also too very likely benign, which will give the patient and their provider comfort in knowing that they can move on and look for other causes of the hereditary cancer, which is what we're contemplating here. These methodologies, mo many laboratories will just choose to disclaim in their test lab report that they are not performed and therefore that portion of the gene has not been analyzed. Uh, we think that there's a, a, an opportunity here to improve the quality of genetic testing in general by ensuring that these are included in some sort of coding infrastructure and therefore reimbursable, hence our inclusion or seek for inclusion here. 
These are the codes and the crosswalk recommendations. Sorry, this is a little bit jumbly, just the way it, can, it, uh, it transferred over to the current format here. There are four of them. Again, I've bucketed these together. So these are very similar to existing GSP procedures, that being 81435 and 81436. Due to the additional analyses, and you can see in the code descriptor itself, utilizing a combination of NGS, Sanger, MLPA, or ACGH, and mRNA analysis, including therefore in the descriptor that all of these methodologies are applied for these tests, we are asking for recommending a additional chromosomal microarray code times 0.5, which would be $900 times 0.5 or 450 additional dollars in addition to the very neat existing crosswalk for a total of 1749.78 for these two tests. The difference price is just due to mapping it to the most appropriate, that being hereditary breast and ovarian cancer at the bottom, a GSP panel that already exists, or the Lynch panel at the top. And then very similar methodology recommended here with the 102U and the 129U, which are additional panels including different sets of genes. Both of these focused on HBOC. The recommendation for the $900 of the microarray code times 0.25 in these is due to the fact that these two panels do not include the genes PMS2, MLH2 that require that additional analysis 100% of the time that they're included. So it's a slightly lighter uh, request for uh, or demand on resources. I'd like to move on to the next set of codes, which are a set of new RNA analysis codes that AMBRI has been awarded. The purpose of the RNA analysis is to improve the overall diagnostic yield of commonly done genomic sequencing procedures. They have three major impacts. They more accurately clarify new variants. So there are circumstances in the literature right now and in ClinVar where reports are being resulted with a very likely pathogenic result when using RNA analysis as an additional level of evidence will yield a very likely benign or benign result. So accurate classification to ensure that we're delivering the highest quality result. To reclassify the high rate of VUSs that are evident in GSP panels and then also to detect previously unidentified you know, deep intronic variants, areas that no, most laboratories aren't even contemplating, can have an impact on exon skipping, included in the RNA analysis, therefore we're capturing these. The sum of the top two in the data so far represent about 11% of variants, so these are significant, and you can see in comparison to deletion duplication analysis, which is widely covered already in the code book, as well as reimbursement and by Medicare, that this is about twice to three times as impactive on the number of additional results we can deliver. I did want to clarify that while these are, this is an additional sequencing procedure, it is a separate one. So they are required from a separate blood tube to start. It's a separate laboratory, must be a separate laboratory. The processes though are very similar or actually identical after that. Therefore the crosswalks for these RNA codes can be very, unique, uh, very neat and simple. This is a handful of genes or a sample of the genes that are included in the panels in question. What you're looking at are the number of exons that are coded for each of the genes in the panel. And you can see here that the number of exons for DNA is identical to the number of exons for RNA. Again, if you work in a molecular lab, this seems obvious. However, many of us don't. Uh, therefore, this is worth articulating and helping to support why these are a simple crosswalk uh, or the recommendation is a neat crosswalk recommendation. These are the codes themselves. Uh, there are a handful of these representing each one of the panels. So they're just a different gene set in each. And therefore, we have recommended a crosswalk to the nearest existing panel code at that same price point, straight and simple. So for instance, the first one is Ambry's Colonext test using RNA analysis. That would be a hereditary colon cancer syndrome panel. Therefore, it would map neatly to 81435, which is the existing CPT1 for colon cancer analysis at the existing NLA of $649. That methodology is repeated as we move down depending upon whether it's a hereditary breast ovarian cancer map or a colon cancer map. And these are three additional codes using the same exact rationale. These are three codes that represent single genes. Therefore, they have to be slightly different, but using the same concept, the same rationale. These three have been recommended to be mapped to a, the, um, I think it was PMS2, excuse me, 81317, which is a single gene already priced in the CPT1 book at $676.50. 
So these would be a one-to-one -one gene test, RNA te gene test to existing gene test already priced map as well. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Any question for those on the line? Thank you. Thank you. Now, next presenter from uh, 21st Century Medicine. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm John Warren. I'm with McDermott Plus Consulting. I'm here on behalf of the Coalition for 21st Century Medicine. C21 is a group of the most innovative diagnostic technology companies combined with clinical labs, researchers, physicians, and venture capitalists, all linked by a common mission, that is to develop and commercialize state-of-the-art diagnostics that improve patient health. <clears throat> Excuse me. We appreciate the opportunity to present at today's meeting. Previously, you heard from two of our member companies, Cernostics and Illumina. Later this afternoon, you'll hear from a third, Myriad Genetics. These companies presented to you their recommendations for four new price, new, their pricing recommendations, excuse me, for four new test codes in, in 2020. The coalition is here to express its support for its member company recommendations. As you'll hear later today, Myriad Genetic Laboratories, the RSC21 member company, will recommend a crosswalk to CPT code 81519 for new code 815X0 the EndoPredict breast oncology test. Both of these codes describe a test that uses the same type of tissue sample, uses the same methodology, both use a proprietary algorithm to determine a risk score that informs therapeutic decision making, that provides prognostic and predictive information for breast cancer management, and they're both performed in a central lab as an LDT. C21 or excuse me, C21 supports this recommended uh, crosswalk. Myriad will also recommend gap filling, new code 0090U, the MyPath melanoma test. There are currently no other MA tests for melanoma that report a categorical result that exists on the CLFS that would be appropriate for crosswalking. In the absence of an approved code for crosswalking, CMS should allow the local contractors to gap fill the new code. C21 also supports this recommendation to gap fill new code 0090U. And as you heard earlier today, Cernostics, again a C21 member company, recommended a crosswalk to CPT code 81538 for new code 0108U, the tissue cipher test. Both codes uh, are advanced, complex protein-based MA tests used for cancer prognosis. They utilize eight or nine protein signatures, respectively, and provide the same types of information as other prognostic tests in prostate or breast cancer. 0108U includes, includes some additional work related to its digital pathology software platform. C21 also supports this recommended crosswalk. And finally, you heard this morning, Illumina, again a C21 member company, recommended actually two alternative crosswalks for their new code 0111U. The first alternative crosswalk recommendation was a combination of CPT codes 81275, 81311, and two times 81276. These were direct crosswalks with the exception of using 81276 twice, the second time for extended variance. In addition, Illumina presented a second alternative crosswalk to one and a half times 81455, this option uses NGS codes for multiple oncologies, on, oncogenes, excuse me, and includes the multiplier for the base cost of the test, the platform, and the FDA approval. Illumina supported either of those recommendations, and C21 supports that recommendation as well. Thank you. Any questions from those present? Any questions from those on the line? Thank you. 
And we'll be moving on, um, skipping American Association for Clinical Chemistry. Although a presentation has been submitted, there will not be a presentation today. Presenter number 26, Logic. So Mike Ryan again here at this time on behalf of uh, Whole Logic. Uh, so, uh, who is the developer and the manufacturer of the aftermarket mycoplasma genitalium assay? Code we're here to talk about today is 8XXXX, infectious agent detection by nucleic acid, DNA or RNA, mycoplasma genitalium amplified probe technique. Uh, this code is appropriate to report both um, Whole Logic's aftema assay as well as other commercial assays and LDTs for MGen that comprise amplified probe tests. Uh, just briefly about Hologic's MGen test is an FDA authorized nucleic acid amplification test, or NAT. It's intended for the qualitative detection of ribosomal RNA from mycoplasma genitalium on the fully automated Panther system. It's intended to be used in the diagnosis of patients um, with signs or symptoms of MGen, both male and female. The recommendation that we're making here is a crosswalk to 87491, which is the code for chlamydia amplified probe, has a uh, calendar year 2019, NLA of $38.99. Went through that. Uh, just briefly to talk about the rationale for that recommendation, and when CMS sets the initial payment rate for a new code, you're supposed to be looking for a comparable test. Um, for, or for a comparable code. And when CMS looks at whether something is comparable or not, looking at several different factors, including clinical factors, test methodology, and resource utilization. As we'll take through quickly here, all three of those um, factors support uh, a potential crosswalk to chlamydia amplified probe. From a clinical perspective, um, both MGen and chlamydia are both sexually transmitted bacterial infections and they both have a similar clinical presentation. Um, both can be asymptomatic. Um, however, when symptoms are present, the symptoms are similar. From a methodology perspective, both MGen and Chlamydia are amplified probe tests, or NATs. They can be run on the same instrumentation, at least from Hologic's perspective. Um, both can be run on the Panther system. And both are run on virtually identical specimen types. So if you look at the FDA clearance for Hologic's MGen and Chlamydia tests, they cleared to be used on both clinician-collected vaginal swabs, clinician-collected clinician endocervical swabs, female and male urine, as well as clinician-collected male urethral swabs. And they have the same underlying molecular chemistry underlying the reporting of those results. And lastly, from a resources perspective, the manual labor required to produce a patient-specific result is identical um, to, for MGen and for chlamydia and virtually identical reagents are required. So if you were to look at the package inserts for both the MGen and the chlamydia test for Hologic, you'd see that they both require the use of amplification reagents, enzyme reagents, probe reagents, target capture reagents, controls, and reconstitution solutions. Any questions? Any question for those on the line? We'll now continue with presentation 27, Castle Bioscience. Hi. I progress with that one right there. Thank you. Hi. Good uh, morning. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm glad I became a citizen last year so I can be here in person. <laughs> So that's excellent. So I'm going to talk about um, our uh, code uh, 88XSO3. As you can see, we used to have a PLA code that will um, expire by the end of the year and will transition to a Category 1 uh, MAAA CPT code. This refers to our assay for uveal melanoma, which is an mRNA gene expression profiling by real-time PCR with 15 genes. 
And this is uh, done in both formalin uh, paraffin embedded tissue as well as um, fine needle aspirate from uveal melanoma patients. Uh, our comment here is that uh, both the PLA code, which was removed, but uh, as well as our uh, category one MAAA CPT code, uh, our, now, our assay has now been granted ADLT status, and that has a different pricing mechanism that uh, is ongoing as we speak. So this test is now an existing uh, ADLT. The um, CMS uh, ADLT panel has indicated that the administrative contractor will determine payment rate in 2020. So we respectfully contend that uh, we probably shouldn't have been in the agenda but that uh, uh, as the process continues, we should be uh, priced as, as per the PAMA process and not um, the GAFIL or um, crosswalk process. So um, the CPT code X, uh, 8XS03 will be effective 1-1-2020, uh, and as I mentioned, it will be priced that way. I'll just... Uh, uh, give a little background about Ubil Maroma, just... Uh, with the interest for making sure that the panel understands the importance of this test. Uh, prior to the introduction of this test, uh, most patients with uveal melanoma would be managed in a very intensive way because up to 30% of them would uh, relapse with metastatic disease at five years, and about half of them overall would relapse with uh, metastatic disease. And there was no way of de determining these patients. With the advent of our test, which actually allows us to differentiate between patients at high risk and low risk for metastasis, what has happened now is that patients who have low risk, who are class one on our test, are actually now removed from that high intensity management process and can be spared, you know, not, on, not only the anxiety, but also the high follow-up and the exposure to radiation that comes from, from the intensive follow-up on these patients. So, the test is now used uh, for over 80% um, of the patients who uh, have, are diagnosed with uveal melanoma in the U.S. every year. I want to reiterate, this is a rare disorder. Uh, only about 1,600 patients are expected to be diagnosed in the U.S. every year. And therefore, um, you know, pricing needs to take into account that this is a rare disorder and we're providing this um, uh, service to uh, patients who, who suffer from this disease. Um, I'll just uh, show here the Kaplan-Meier plots from the pivotal study done um, uh, to uh, validate the test. You can see the survival rates there for class one versus class two patient. And this test has now been included um, in NCCN guidelines. It is the recommended test that is done to uh, determine management of, of, of these patients. So um, uh, fairly well adopted in, in, in the clinic and it is really the way patients are being managed today uh, to that. So again, just reiterate what the test does. It classifies patients into low or high risk and that determines how the patient is going to do. This has actually resulted in a significant savings for the system by removing patients from this high intensity management and decreasing the follow-up, the intensity of, of, of imaging and um, you know, uh, it also has improved the ability of select patients for uh, clinical trials as we don't have a really good therapy yet for metastatic uveal melanoma. And with that, I will stop here and take questions. Any questions for those on the line? If not, we'll move on to presentation 28, Karn Diagnostics. Okay, thank you. Good morning, I'm Kerry Bush from Karen Diagnostics. Uh, we developed a new um, gastric emptying breath test. It measures the rate of solid phase gastric emptying and can identify dysmotilities of the stomach. It's the only FDA-approved test for this. It's non-radioactive and it's standardized. It is a complex test in that uh, it is regulated by the FDA as a class three medical device. It uh, is a novel test that went through the PMA pathway and it's regulated as a combination drug 
medical device. <clears throat> uh, historically, the way gastric emptying has been measured is the patient is referred to a nuclear medicine center and uh, consumes a radioactive test meal. They're scanned over the evaluation period and uh, the amount of radiation remaining in the stomach is calculated and um, the results are reported as a percent of test meal emptied. With the GEBT, we, we use a stable, rare form of carbon called carbon-13. It is non-radioactive. Um, the substrate we use is a blue-green algae that is highly digestible. We grow those cultures in a drug facility in which the only carbon it can have is carbon-13, so all the proteins, the lipids, and the carbohydrates are labeled. Uh, we then um, harvest that mass after about six weeks and uh, lyophilize it, and then it's mixed as a component into a test meal. Once that test meal is consumed by the patient, it gives rise to carbon-13 labeled CO2. The meal empties from the stomach, is absorbed across the duodenum, and then uh, rapidly metabolized, generating C13CO2. If I could draw your attention to the curves, the lower left set of curves, uh, the dash line is um, the cutoff point. Rates above that are, uh, reflect normal rates of gastric emptying. Curves below that, or values below that, represent delayed gastric emptying or slow emptying. So normal patients have this nice uh, curve that rises and then uh, declines after about two hours. Whereas delayed patients, because that meal is delayed and absorbed more slowly and metabolized, they have lower curves. It's interesting that um, the value at any time point is valuable, but these curves are diagnostically valuable in that the um, slow patients have lower values and continuously rise. And that's very definitive for gastroparesis. Um, the top part of that report is an actual patient reported to the clinician, very delayed gastric emptying. Note that we report the, um, the rate at each time point, six different time points, and uh, we report the status at each of those time points. Um, we felt because this could be assayed in a clinical laboratory that a PLA code was appropriate for this. The um, descriptor for this code is uh, gastric emptying, serial collection of seven-time breast specimens, non-radioisotope carbon-13, spirulina substrate analysis of each specimen by gas isotope ratio mass spectrometer, reported as rate of C13CO2 excretion. It's a mouthful. Um, uh, it, from the FDA's perspective, it's intended for uh, measurements of solid phase gastric emptying and identification, predominantly uh, uh, identification of dysmotilities, but predominantly for delayed gastric emptying or gastroparesis. There are a few other carbon-13 tests out there, but they are so different in terms of their methodology, um, their clinical application, the level of personnel that have to be used that we don't think, uh, and the complexity and analysis time and reporting, that there, uh, there are any uh, comparable uh, codes on the fee schedule. So we do not recommend a crosswalk, but we recommend a gap fill process. There is one code that incorporates a C13 label on the clinical lab fee schedule. It is a test called H. pylori. Um, uh, H. pylori is an infectious organism, um, and this test uses a carbon uh, 13 label to identify it. I just wanted to contrast the two. Uh, basically to show that these are not comparable. With the gastric emptying breath test, we have to collect seven specimens over four hours, uh, two over 15 minutes for, uh, for the H. pylori test. Clinical use, we're, we're looking at gastric uh, functionality and dysmotilities. They're looking at an infectious organism. Uh, we've got to use high complexity, high precision gas isotope ratio mass spectrometry. Uh, they use a bench top infrared analyzer. Um, the significant costs in the mass specs, as you can see. Manufacturing costs just to grow the spirulina incorporated in the test meal is $139. That does not have any GNA uh, or analysis costs in it. The acquisition cost of a kit for H. pylori, somewhere between 20 and 40. I don't know what the manufacturing cost is on that. Uh, we've got to run standards because these uh, 
gas isotope ratio mass spectrometry uh, instruments are they're rare they're not used in the clinical laboratory industry very much the sample has to be returned to a reference laboratory and um, it takes us about 82 minutes to prep analyze and create these reports versus two minutes on h pylori and um, we're reporting six independent gastric emptying rates and the complexity of those calculations uh, is high. They're based on a series of complex patient dose-specific equations, uh, whereas uh, H. pylori is a uh, yes-no for infection, dichotomous cutoff point. So we don't think there's any comparable codes, so we recommend that this go through the gap fill process. Thank you. Any questions from those in the audience? Any questions from those on the line? If not, we'll move on to our next presenter, Accelerate Diagnostics. Good morning, my name is Natalie Brown and I'm here representing Accelerate Diagnostics. Today I'll be discussing code 0086U. I'll be presenting approximately six minutes worth of material to allow ample time for questions and ensure we all get to lunch on time. The Accelerate Pheno system, coupled with the Accelerate Pheno BC kit, provides fast organism identification and antibiotic susceptibility test results from a positive blood culture. We are today seeking a gap fill designation for this technology based on two key points. First, there is no substantially equivalent device on market or predicate device. And second, there is high clinical value resulting from the use of this test. In addition to providing organism identification and antibiotic susceptibility test results from positive blood cultures, this test provides minimum inhibitory concentration results, or MICs, the vital piece of information that best enables clinicians to optimize antibiotic therapy for bacteremic patients. Across the U.S. and beyond, this technology is improving outcomes for patients with bacteremia and sepsis. Sepsis is costly. It is the leading cause of death in U.S. hospitals and impacts over 1.7 million Americans annually, resulting in approximately 270,000 deaths and roughly $27 billion in healthcare costs. Several studies have shown that time is life for septic patients. A 7.6% increase in mortality risk has been proven due to each hour of delayed antimicrobial therapy. Furthermore, initial therapy can be ineffective up to 30% of the time for septic patients while clinicians are waiting on laboratory results. Inappropriate initial therapy results in increased mortality, the need for mechanical ventilation, longer, length, longer stays in both the intensive care unit and the overall hospital visit, Faster antibiotic susceptibility results can improve these outcomes by enabling the switch to optimal th to appropriate therapy one to two days faster. The test purpose and workflow are shown here. This simplified workflow means that the technology is easier to use than other methodologies with dramatically reduced hands-on time for lab technicians. But let's focus on the most important issue at hand here, the impact to the patient. This technology allows the lab to quickly get results back to the clinicians, enabling them to act and optimize antibiotic therapy. The key distinction here is that laboratorians are not waiting for isolates to grow on petri dishes, but rather are able to use positive blood cultures as the sample input. This test utilizes FISH technology to identify the organism or organisms present in the patient's blood culture. The ID technology is a necessary step that allows us to get to the true value of the test, the antibiotic susceptibility results. Once the device determines the organism identification, it automatically proceeds to test the appropriate subset of antibiotics on board. This is where the real magic happens. Our technology provides antibiotic susceptibility testing with true minimum inhibitory concentration values and categorical interpretation as susceptible, intermediate, or resistant to each antibiotic tested. This is done using high-powered microscopy and imaging, watching the organisms grow or, di or die off in real time in the presence of antibiotics, and comparing those images to a database of known images of organisms of known MIC values. 
These phenotypic results are independent of resistance mechanism and are reported as final rather than preliminary results, enabling the clinicians to treat with confidence. Other methodologies on market provide either partial information that stops short of phenotypic AST and MIC results or take days rather than hours to perform. The only device on market that provides both the breadth of diagnostic information needed to confidently prescribe optimal antibiotic therapy within the same shift of a positive blood culture is the Accelerate Pheno system. There is no doubt that this is a novel technology requiring a gap full determination. Two other federal agencies have already made the same determination. FDA in 2017 by granting a de novo clearance based on no valid predicate device, and the US Army in 2018 by granting a sole source justification for the US Army Medical Command. The Accelerate Pheno Test VC kit is a breakthrough technology unlike anything else on market. It provides clinically actionable information approximately 40 hours faster than other methods enabling clinicians to switch patients to optimal antibiotic therapy sooner, which has been shown to decrease overall antibiotic use, reduce adverse events such as C. difficile infections and acute kidney injury, decrease mortality, and shorten length of stay. Additionally, there is a societal benefit based on the reduced development of new antibiotic resistance. These benefits also lead to the potential for an overall cost savings to the hospital. Two stu different studies conducted by hospitals currently using our system have found two and three day length of stay savings respectively, each for a different subset of bacteremic patients. Accounting for a totality of bacteremic patients with varying causative organisms and clinical presentations, we conservatively estimate an overall average of at least one day length of stay savings per bacteremic patient. Vancomycin is used nearly universally for initial coverage for gram-positive bacteria. It requires expensive and time-consuming therapeutic drug monitoring. So while the drug itself is relatively inexpensive, the cost savings is derived from decreased healthcare costs associated with its use. Additionally, we estimate that one case of C. difficile infection will be avoided per, 100, per 365 patients based on a reduction of usage of broad-spectrum antibiotics. Similarly, we estimate that one case of acute kidney injury may be avoided per, per 365 patients. This collectively represents a cost avoidance of over $2,950 per patient. Therefore, we believe that $738, approximately one quarter of that value, is a fair charge. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to prevent the evidence for a gap fill determination. At this time, I'll be happy to take your questions. Any question for those on the line? If not, we'll be moving on to our next presenter. American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics. Uh, good morning, I'm Kathleen Ruska and I'm here to represent the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, of which I'm a fellow. I'll be discussing today our recommendations for two new molecular pathology codes, 813X1 and 813X2. 813X2 is a new code for sequencing of the PALB2 gene. This is the full gene sequence analysis. Its purpose is to detect variants within the entire gene. And the method is bidirectional sequencing of the coding regions as well as the exon intron boundaries by either Sanger sequencing or next generation sequencing for hereditary cancer indications. We are recommending a crosswalk to the existing CPT code of 81201 for adenomatous polyposis. Uh, the rationale is that uh, this gene has similar size and complexity to PALB2, therefore uh, necessitating similar methods and resources to sequence a comparable amount of DNA. The second test code recommendation is for 813X2, 
which is testing of known familial variants within the PALB2 gene. Uh, this is a more targeted approach uh, driven by PCR amplification um, of a targeted region for a known familial variant followed by a genotyping or sequencing methodology such as Sanger sequencing. Our recommendation uh, for this new test code is a crosswalk again to um, APC 81202, again based on the rationale that this uh, testing requires similar methods and resources to, to detect those known familial variants in cascade testing. Thank you. Are there any questions? Any questions from those on the line? If not, we'll move on to our next presentation. Presenter number 31, American Clinical Laboratory Association. Oh, great, thank you. Well, good morning. My name is Joan Kegerize, and I'm with the American Clinical Laboratory Association. And we really appreciate the opportunity to provide comments for recommendations for the new and reconsidered grade codes for the um, calendar year 2020. Today, ACLA will speak on um, multiple codes. So for most of the codes that we provide recommendations, we have offered um, crosswalk to existing codes based on the methods, resources, and the genetic material interrogated. Um, sometimes we do have to crosswalk to a portion of an existing test code. And um, as we will go through this today, you will see when we do that. So our first um, comments are on the reconsiderated codes for um, gene analysis for breast cancer 1 and 2, full sequence, and gene analysis for breast cancer 1, full sequence. And we are commenting on these reconsiderated codes because of the codes that CMS chose. We do not believe that they represent the work and resources performed in these assays. The purpose of these assays is to detect the variants within one or both BRCA genes in their entirety. And the methods used are for next-gen sequencing and Sanger sequencing. So our recommendation is for crosswalk to the existing test, 81408, because of the um, methods used and the, compare, the comp comparison in the size of the gene to the DMD gene. And for the 81665 reconsidered code, our recommendation is for crosswalk for 50% of 81506. 81408, <laughs> excuse me. So for the molecular pathology codes that ACLA has recommendations for, we base this information on the materials used, the methods, the resources, and the amount of genetic material interrogated. So for the new test code 813X1, we recommend a crosswalk to the existing test code 81317 because of the same material resources and size of genetic information interrogated. For the new test code 813X2, we recommend a crosswalk to 81318 and for the same purpose um, to, um, has the same size of the gen genetic information interrogated for the gene PMS2 with similar methods and resources. For the PIC3CA, new test code 8 XX01, we recommend crosswalk to 81314, and it would be for the same amount of work and resources and the gene analysis interrogated. And similarly, for the last new molecular pathology code, 8XXOX, for the cytogenetic, cytogenomic neoplasia microarray, we recommend a crosswalk to 81219 and 81229, excuse me, and for similar resources, um, work performed and the genetic information interrogated. So ACLA will make the um, Recommendations for the two new MAAA tests 
And um, MAAA tests can be um, either gap fill process or crosswalk. Since now the MAAAs have been on the clinical lab fee schedule for at least three years, um, we have um, used the existing MAAAs in our recommendations for crosswalking the new test codes this year. So for test code 815XO, the oncology breast, we support the crosswalk recommendation to 81519. And the um, it has the same source of the same um, tissue and the same quantitative um, real-time PCR method to measure the expression of the set of um, for use in breast cancer management. And for the new test code eight one five XX. We agree with the information provided earlier today by Decipher Biosciences presented here to Crosswalk Recommendation to 81519. ACLA um, has provided these recommendations for the six new chemistry codes, which would be the therapeutic drug assays. ACLA supports the crosswalk recommendations made by Mayo earlier today here for the six new therapeutic drug assays. For the microbiology code, um, the infectious agent detection 8XXX to report mycoplasm genitalium using Amplify probe technique. The recommendation um, is supported 87491, which has the same information provided by Hologic um, presenting, presenting earlier today. ACLA looked at the PLA codes. There's numerous PLA codes, as everyone is aware. Um, we understand that the labs that have and sponsor the PLA codes have a stake in these codes, and they've gathered this information. Um, ACLA reviewed information from some of our members, um, that, and the laboratories provided the information on the assays to us. We vetted that through our CPT committee and our experts and agree with several of the PLA recommendations made. So I'm just going to quickly go through these. So for 64U and for 65U, ACLA um, supports the recommendation made by Biorad. For the 70U, all the way down to 76U, presented by Mayo today. ACLA supports those recommendations. And then for the 101U to 103U and 129U to 138U, ACLA supports the recommendations for these codes made by Ambry Genetics. Are there any questions? Are there any questions from those on the line? Perfect. So it is a couple of minutes before noon, and so we're going to take a 45-minute break. Um, just a couple of notes. The cafe closes at 2 o'clock, so um, this will be one of your last opportunities to visit the cafe. Um, it won't happen before our second break. Um, given the fact that we are kind of on schedule and we're moving along quite nicely, we may begin session 2 before 3.45. Um, so please um, make sure you're here and prompt and ready to go. So we'll meet back here again at 1245.